Amador County Board of Supervisors on Tuesday, June 26, 2018. We went into closed session and on item 3B, we denied the claim of Daniel Grant. On item 4, direction was given to staff and on item 5, we approved the confidential minutes. So please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, public matters not on the agenda. Discussion items only, no action to be taken. Any person may address the board at this time upon any subject within the jurisdiction of the Amador County Board of Supervisors. However, any matter that requires action may be referred to staff and or committee for a report and recommendation for possible action at a subsequent board meeting. Please note there is a three minute limit per person. Any public? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Dan Morris. I'm uh, from Ione. Uh, you can tell me whether this is the proper uh, place on the, on the agenda or not, but I have an objection and a challenge on a, an item that I believe is improperly um, on the agenda before the board. Um, it's item 6F. Motocross. Ione Sands Motocross Test Day. Yes, and... Um, that has not been uh, um, heard before the uh, uh, Planning Commission uh, pursuant to uh, Government Code uh, 65857. Uh, that should go before uh, the Planning Commission first. So I'm uh, requesting that that, that item uh, not be taken up in, in action uh, today. Okay, we'll ask our legal counsel here. Well, what I would say is this is matters not on the agenda, and you're referring to an item matter that's on that the agenda. Matter that is on the agenda. So that would be, when that matter is called, that would be the appropriate time to discuss that agenda item. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Good morning, Steve. Oh, good morning. Uh, this is Steve. I'm Steve Christensen from Sutter Creek. And I wanted to invite uh, members of the Board of Supervisors to a rally that will be held uh, on Saturday, June 30th, at the, uh, just outside of the Sutter Creek, uh, the Trinity Episcopal Church in Sutter Creek. The rally is, going to be, is in support of family unification, kind of a family val supporting family values. Uh, it's going to be from 9 o'clock in the morning till 1030. Uh, please bring a sign. You're invited, and so is anyone in the audience invited. This is a non-denominational. It's just not for Episcopalians only. Um, we ask that we, we have parking available at the church, but if there's an overflow, if we happen to have more people, which I'm hoping we will, we ask that people park at the uh, transit center on Valley View because we want to be, we love our neighbors and we don't want people parking in the businesses close by and preventing customers from getting there. So uh, we want to be good neighbors to them. So if there's extra parking, we would like you to go to the, uh, the transit center. We would like you to bring signs that you can carry out in, uh, during our uh, rally. Uh, we ask that you keep the signs civil um, again, this is a non-denominational uh, rally. People from all religions or people who are non-churchgoers are more than welcome to participate in this. And so you are invited to be there this Saturday, June 30th, from 9 o'clock to 1030 in the morning, um, supporting family re reunification. Okay, any questions? Questions? <clears throat> I hope you. to see you there. Thank you very much. All right. Other public, excuse me, matters. I will keep mine short and sweet. I usually am only asked to come in front of anybody because they can't solve problems. As you all know, I have a very high IQ of 180. 
My family has been here since 1849. So I think... Oh, would you share your name with us, please? Noel W. Stewart, Ion Valley. Thank you. So I have been called by somebody here to investigate something. I went to Stanford, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, my alma mater. I asked mathematicians to make calculations, see if those calculations came to my agreement. They did. It shows that there was probably about 2,000 people that were turned away from the polls on election day. My family have fought for the rights of all Americans. We have been in every major battle in the world. We have been in every major battle in the United States, starting from 1754. I'm so sorry to stop you right now. I hope now. that you guys will do what is right. Okay, thank you. But that is an agenda item. I didn't know. Okay. Anyone else from the public? Okay. Let's move to approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. That would be Pat, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. How about approval of items on the consent agenda? Move to approve, Madam Chairman. Second. Okay. We have the motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Now we're going to item six, the regular agenda. And we'll start with 6A, the grand jury report from Eric Forberg, Foreman. Good morning to you all. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Eric Forberg. I'm the foreman for the 2017-2018 grand jury. I delivered the report to you. Um, we have our final report. Um, as residents of Amador County, the things in this report were all very important to us. Um, we investigated them with open eyes and open ears and wanted to get to the root of these matters that as a body of 19 citizens we uh, thought were important to us. Does the Board of Supervisors have any questions about the report so far? My understanding is we're just supposed to accept it right now because we will be, go ahead. Yeah, I would just accept it for now and, and allow staff to, to uh, offer uh, responses and um, uh, we can talk about it when the board considers its, its response. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you for right. your time. Appreciate it and All thank right. you for your time on the grand jury. Thank you. Thank yes. Okay, hey, item 6B, discussion and possible action to a request from Judge Day to increase the grand jury budget, which is currently overdrawn by approximately $8,000. So the request is to increase the budget by 10500 But the, I understand that number has changed. The number has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, just to, to give a little background, the grand jury budget is, uh, the funding of the grand jury is compelled uh, by the state to the board. The board is compared, compelled to fund them basically to the level that they deem appropriate with the judge's consent. Uh, the, they have run about $8,000 to the negative this year. Uh, they were, uh, the, we received a request from Judge Day to increase that amount to 10500 and then we just received another bill from their outside counsel for another 3500 So I would recommend that we increase their budget for the 17-18 fiscal year by $14,000 out of contingency. So, um, and my understanding is we don't exactly have a choice about that. It, it does say we shall do uh, this once uh, we receive a, a proper request from the judge and we have received that request. Although that request was for 10-5, for uh, I still think we should do it for 14. Okay. Recommendation. So basically Questions saying from the board? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Basically, judge approves a request if, the, if she finds him to be um, warranted. Correct. Saying the additional 3500 hasn't been approved by the judge, but you believe it's it has been approved by the judge, well, it but it wasn't included in that $10,500. Okay. That we, she has approved the bill and given it to us. Oh, okay. So just putting A and B together, we know that the numbers are going to total up. That's good. We can add. Yeah. Try. 
Yeah, I find it just a little bit ironic that, um, well, I guess we can talk about it. I guess we can talk about it here. They pointed out there's a number of uh, items that the counties may be um, lacking in spending it, having enough money to fund our um, operations. I wish we could just say, hey, we want more money and uh, get it from somewhere. So do not have the opportunity to ask for more money. That's all I have to say. With that, um, any other comments, questions from the board? So are we approving it for what, 14000 Yes. $14,000, yes. Any public comments? No? I'd make a motion. I'd a motion, yeah. That um, we provide funding to grand jury uh, out of $14,000. Second. That's an increase, right? Yes. It's a budget increase right. for budget the 1718 budget, yes. Okay. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, I should have mentioned, obviously, Richard Forrester's not here. He was at a conference in, I believe, Canada, was it? Toronto. Toronto, and he's coming home today. So you'll see him at the next meeting, but not this one. Okay, that's a good point. Um, I am going to change, I'm going to switch agenda items 6C and 6D, and um, I'm going to first take item 6D, which is the discussion of some issues about this election process. And we've got Kim Grady and Greta here to, um, to talk to us. Do you guys want to? Speak up. Morning. Thank Morning, you. ladies. Do you have a question, or did you just want to hear what our plans are for, for well, November? Well, what's most important to me uh, is I'm sure you've seen the list of, frankly, screw-ups. And um, so what's most important to me is that you assure us what you are going to do differently so that this does not happen again, especially running out of ballots. Yes. I have personally heard from many constituents who were taken, their right to vote was not given to them. So go ahead. That's, yeah, no, that's not okay, and we're very sorry that anybody was even inconvenienced in the process. Um, but for immediately what we can do is obviously order more ballots. For November, we would order at least 75% of just the registered poll voters. And going forward from there, you can start at at least 25% above what the last turnout is and go up from there to make sure that there is plenty. Um, we also, we are, look, we are reviewing and revamping some poll worker training to include more in-depth what-if scenarios Good. Um, so they're more prepared uh, and increase the outreach to re recruit more poll workers because we had a, a, a lot of turnover at the last minute this time, so we want to make sure that we have a large pool. Uh, we also intend to add additional what we call field techs. They're like a response unit um, so that we will have uh, more available throughout the county so that the response time to the polling places would be shortened so that there was more. And I believe um, Mr. Eiley shared that if you get to a situation like that in the fu in future elections that you can contact him and we will find county staff yes and that was wonderful that and that was also something for for later to just to make sure that everything's done on as it's supposed to be that some county employees could even fill in as a, a poll worker if we have some last minute cancellations as we did this time that we would have them available right to, to fill in right Questions about that? Board. Board questions? Well, um, beyond this, was there going to be any kind of inquiry or formal process? Not that I'm aware of, but that would, um, that would start after the canvas has been accepted. Anything would have to start from there. Yes. Um, I guess one, one thing I'd like to know is... Um, amount of ballots that were available 
how many did that? I like to know how many that overran, like at each polling place. Um, the people that didn't get a ballot their their first approach to polling place. Or how many? So you yeah, I don't have that. I don't know. I don't have that information. Or how many ballots were at that polling place, and how many were actually cast? Uh, well, we could. I could give you the numbers. I don't have them with me, but I can give you numbers of the uh, amount of original ballots were, that were sent exactly. to each polling place, and then we can look at how many were cast at that polling place. That'd be nice. To sure. know. Additional. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and the additional ballots that were taken there. That for you for sure. Okay, so you'll come back today, or at oh a yeah, we could get those future today. meeting. Okay. Yeah. Other questions by the board. Just a comment, the, uh, was it five counties that did the vote by mail with extended? Have with you, the vote centers? That seemed like something that might be good for us. That's actually yes. something. Have you seen the results of that yet, or is it yeah. still being studied? The, well, it'll be looked into, I'm sure. But there, the two counties that I know of, Sacramento and Nevada, had pretty much doubled their turnout. One went from like tw in the 20s to... 49 and then a Nevada I think went up to 57 percent where maybe they were in the 30s so it, it it was then that's one of the things that we would absolutely look forward to no, it won't work for November we don't have well, that I understand right. that. but yeah. in the future absolutely and that's where the state would like you to go so we just yes. have to look into the all the possibilities and because I believe Oregon does that entirely mm -hmm. they're all mail ballot from what I understand so I would encourage going in that direction as requirements from state. Hey, we are only allowed to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll try it a third time. Okay. Uh, that is the requirement of the state. We are only allowed to do what the state of California allows okay. us to do. And so it will have to go through them as to whether or not we can do just mail ballots, if we can only do mail ballots and vote centers it will and this experiment this time with the four uh, precincts or excuse me the four counties will be very indicative of what they how happy they are with this concept I guess a question I'd have too is um, the number of uh, vote at the poll voters that actually voted that had the opportunity to vote and did vote was it pretty Answer what normally votes at the polls. I, I, th I think it's actually a little bit higher because everything's up a little bit. But we have we're at a total of just over sixty percent turnout for the countywide. And normally a little under that, like in the high fifties. Fifty-seven, fifty-nine. Yeah, and say we have seven, a little over seven thousand poll voters, and we have thirty-seven five five. That voted at the polls that day. Okay, so it's not a real big anomaly there compared to past no. elections. No, there's not. Other than other than maybe that you had one election. I I talked to you earlier was in the four, in the forties, mid forties. Yes. Oh, 2014. Yeah, was mid forty. That was a gubernatorial primary. Yeah. Okay, I guess what, what what point I'm making is it's not like you normally have 60 percent of people voting and only 40 percent voted this election because. That is correct. They didn't vote or whatever. Um, that is correct. People did vote. That is correct. Do you have any guess about how many people actually were not allowed to vote? No, I, I, just because I would have no way of, of knowing. We've heard a few stories, like I'm sure all of you have. Yes. I'd but, like to ask right. that. I mean, you didn't allow people to vote? No. That, well, what do you mean that's not what you allow? Said. But yeah. well, that's just says how many people are not allowed to vote. I mean, I don't well, think that's correct terminology. That's right. Well, I agree with you. from their perspective, it was because, you know, I mean, I can give you an example that um, one person went to the polling place, was told, you can't vote now because we have no ballots. We'll take your number and call you when we have ballots. And she says they never called her. So I don't know. I mean, this is anecdotal information. Well, I had something similar happen. I got the the polling place in dry town and they said uh, hey the person in front of you got the last ballot and i says okay i says um what do i do and they says you can have more ballots coming uh come back and vote um they said they'll keep the polls open 
whoever's in line at 8 o'clock um, will vote, even if, even if it's after 8 o'clock, as long as you're in that line, they say you can vote. So I showed up at 7.30 and voted. And there's ballots there, so. That's correct, and that's, that would be part of the training, but I, I know I've heard different stories, but yes, if you are in line at 8 o'clock, no matter if there's one person or 100 people in line, you will vote. Am I happy about what happened? Um, absolutely not. No, uh, none of us are. I think it's something, I think the voters that we serve don't want to see it happen again. Absolutely not. I think the not. supervisors don't want to see it happen again. Absolutely um, not. And I think you don't want to see it happen Absolutely again. Absolutely not. Um, one other thing I'd like to touch on, we also had an issue with um, wrong information. I think it's about 418 voters in my district were sent, I think it was voter sample um, oh, this, information. The candidate statements, correct? Yes. That were incorrect, and then the corrections were incorrect, and then I think the corrections to that were incorrect. Um, yeah, there was there was a number of them that, that were not. It was really it was, it was three corrections. It was a little amazing. It yeah, we had sent three correction yes. notices. It was dreadful. Yeah, and I think that's something we should really look at. Absolutely. I, I would like to um, personally like to see maybe an overview done of what happened there and why. Um, I don't know if it can be done in office or if you need to find somebody past elections that could look at it and well, some steps we, that we don't do that again. Yeah, I agree with that. And um, what I'd like to suggest to the board is that we consider hiring someone to do an analysis of the problems that we had with this, um, you know, a professional to come in and have an objective look at what went wrong. We've... Um we talked to the Secretary of State to see if they had resources that that could do that, and unfortunately they do not. But we, um, just talking with colleagues, have a few names that we can supply to the board, to, right. to Chuck, to Greg, that are retired registrars of voters that are highly right. respected through the state that, that maybe they would come in and audit the processes and I'll learn from it. That would be great. Thank you. Do you think we should have a motion, Chuck, to... Would like to direct staff to bring back yes, uh, some names and, and options in two weeks. We will put it on the that next done. agenda. That would be great. So let's let's put it on the next agenda. Yeah, okay. that'd be better. I'd support great. that for sure. Okay. Great. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Thank Another you. set of eyes never hurts. Yep. Absolutely so I'm going to open not. open it up to the public. Any questions, comments from the public? Mr. May. Bill May, I want to thank this uh, staff, the clerk's office and elections, for doing their best they could to overcome some very difficult problems. So, I think they owe a uh, they're owed a some support <laughs> along the way. It's going to come from me. And the other thing that I'd like to comment on is the gentleman that said two thousand people were turned away. What's he been smoking? Thank you. Okay, let's calm down here, <laughs> sir. Hello, my name's Harry Cowan. <clears throat> I voted at the uh, Fiddletown polling office. There was electioneering going on inside the polling place by these two gentlemen who were there. I'd like to know if my ballot was counted because they didn't have an a electronic cal uh, tabulating machine on hand. They had a, just a box with a slot to put the vote in, the ballot in. I asked him what happened. He said, we want to keep the Russians out. Well, I said, I like that. That sounds good. But, and then it quickly changed into something else, which I will not repeat. I'll deal with those gentlemen personally. In any case, uh, what was the election budget last time and versus this time? Does anybody know? I don't know. Chuck, do you know? Give me a minute and I can find it. Okay. So, Kim, can you check, you or Greta, check if his, if his ballot was counted? Is that which, well, that was one of your questions? Yeah. If you would. Yeah. 
And uh, who and why was the voting machines changed? Why is there not an electronic tabulation machine right there at the, bowling, at the polling place? Who made that decision and why? And again, I have to turn to Kim. Do you want to talk about the voting machines, Kim? Our um, M100 machines that used to be at all, each of the polling places, mm -hmm. and they were, they were dying. So we had to come up with a, what we were going to do next. Uh, and because the state is wanting to go towards the vote centers and the vote by mail process, we didn't think it was sound to go buy another 30, 40 machines to put them out if we were going to have to go to vote centers. So what we do is a central count now. We have a one big uh, tabulation machine. And so when the votes come in from the polls, just like with vote by mails, they are, they are run through the machine and then tabulated in the office instead of through that little machine where they brought a card in. And Kim, since you mentioned the machine, I've, I've heard that um, that machine crunched up some ballots. What happened then? It does, and if the machine, uh, if they are deemed unreadable by the machine, that's what we duplicate them so that they can go through the machine. The counter has to count it so that it can be tabulated. <laughs> and there's a, there's a very strict process for duplicating oh, yeah. ballots. With I would hope. Witnesses yeah. and no, that's a two-person process. Yeah. I'm not aware of this state. Those are those. Mandate. That's the uh, pilot counties that they use this time. This is the process. This is where the state's going, or in the future. Is this an? It's already in code. No. Well, actually, yes, I was. I'm sorry. Yes. I was aware. Yes, it's, uh, I think there's a general push to go to mostly vote by mail. But in that process, as you may be aware, many citizens really prefer to physically go to a polling place and cast their ballots. So I think what, what's happening is that there's a move to have all mail ballots, but one or two or, I don't know, yeah, one per two. 10,000 or something. One for 10,000, yes. Both. Right. Yeah. So that it's, it's a hybrid of both. Yeah, it's more like a hybrid. So that you do have the opportunity to come in to a polling place if you wish. And it's actually extended. It's not just on um, But everybody in that process, everybody gets a vote by mail ballot. And if they choose to use it as a mail, that's fine if they choose to go into the polling. Were you able to, Chuck, were you able to, oops, sorry. I, I, I was, yes. The, uh, yeah, no the total election Thank budget. Thank you, Kim. The uh, total elections budget for 1718 was 563 thousand dollars. 1617 was 509 thousand. What was that the, number again? Uh, for 1718, 563 436. Okay. 1617, 509, 555. 16 was 524 700. It was a 350 thousand dollar difference between. One no. election and the next? No, 563 to 509. So that's a. Uh, oh, 563, you said. I'm sorry. I thought you said 163. Okay. 563. Okay. That's the total budget, including all cost allocation for, for the entire elections department. Not just for that one election. We don't have anything broken out by the election. But that's okay. And that's all available online. Uh, all right, well, I'll yield, but we all want, as Americans, a transparent and free and, and dependable voting system. This is fundamental to our republic, our democracy. And what happened this time is inexcusable. Uh, why we are even considering only ordering 75%, statistically, things have changed a great deal since this last election. I think we'll all agree this country is not the same country it was before this election. Now, so everything is suspect in my mind. Even our local little Amador County elections, questionable in my mind because of what we have going on in DC. So that's just a statement. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Hi, my name is Don Santos and I actually was unable to vote. And I 
I felt it was important to come today to, to so somebody, you know, from, my, from a firsthand experience, um, my polling place was Comanche. I got there around just before 5 o'clock to make sure I had to vote. And I'm not a voter who, who just shows up and marks some boxes. I research my candidates. I research the issues. If I don't know about them, I don't vote about them. I merely mark them out. Um, they told me that I was, they were out of ballots. And they should be there and somebody should be bringing them. They made a phone call about 3 o'clock and they were, should be there. So I waited maybe 20 minutes or so. Um, and... Um, they didn't show, and there were several other people, you know, a considerable number of people that were standing there also waiting. And so I went, went to home, came back again around 5.30, and they they oh, we don't know, we don't know. And then I showed back up again about 7.30, and they still said they had no idea if they were going to get them or not get them, and they didn't know, and they said at this point everybody was out. They said maybe I should go over to um, a neighboring ballot over at the... Um, park area over there. I went over there. They, they sent me back to my, my place. And so I, never, I was never able to vote. And I honestly felt very cheated. Of course. I, I, myself, my husband, my adult children, um, we had, um, there was another um, couple and their adult child who had been there. They were there when I got there the first time. They were still there when I got there the last time, and we all kind of left together. At this point, it was, you know, 7.30. We assumed we weren't going to get ballots. Whether some showed up there or not, it's my understanding that eventually something showed up there, but nobody said, hey, we've got some being printed. We've got, they said, hey, if you've got your sample ballot, you can bring that, which I didn't have any longer because I shredded it because it had my personal information on the back of it. And... Um, I could have done that, but there was people like sharing a sample ballot. I saw a family putting all their votes on one ballot with their name on the back of it. That kind of takes away the privacy of your voting because your name's literally written on there. Then you're going to give that to somebody else, and they're going to transfer it to, a, to another ballot that's then going to be voted. So I really feel like I don't know if the people who are in our office now, are, if they're actually the winners or not. Because I don't feel that this was a, a, a legitimate um, voting because whether there would have been one or, or, or 3,000 people who didn't get a vote, we have no way of knowing. Thank you, and I'm so sorry that happened. Well, I just don't know what are you, what's, what's the, is there a process? Are you going to do something? Is, is my, do I just, am I just out of luck? Did I not get a vote? Is that what happens? And me and everybody else who didn't get a vote? Well, my understanding is this time, um, since the, bo the vote is likely to be accepted, um, that that you lost the opportunity this time doesn't really feel fair. I totally understand that, and you're not the only person I've heard from. It's I have I have four members of my family who didn't get a vote. So that's four votes for whoever whoever it may be that didn't get our didn't get our vote. Right. Whether whether we voted all for the same person or didn't vote for the same person. I don't know. We don't talk about it. We keep our, we keep that, you know, that's something that's very private. We keep it private. We don't talk about, even in our family, who we vote for president, who we vote for, for, you know, your positions, you know, it's, we, we keep that. And way to avoid disputes, right? Well, that was taken away. That was, I mean, even those people who, who wrote their name and turned in sample ballots and put them on a sample ballot, their name and address was right on the back of it. So there was no more privacy of who they voted for. Everybody who looked at that sample ballot knew exactly who you're voting for. Right. And right. it's not supposed to be like that. And I really feel like there should be something done about it, whether it be, you know, allowing those people who didn't get a vote the vote and add those to the count or revote or whatever. I think there should be, I don't think it should be, oh, well, too bad. I think that's not a, a correct approach to do. Well, let me ask Greg. Um, you're familiar now, especially with election law, and is what are, I mean, I believe we could ask for a recount, right? Or no? Someone could or, ask or, for, for a recount after the, the, the vote is, the count is certified. Right. Um, but that's not, that wouldn't address the or, issue that people are that people complaining didn't vote. about. Now let, right. now, and, let me, and, now let me ask you, don't you have a way, I mean, I get phone calls when the power goes out. I get phone calls when, when uh, you know, when we had a water leak, we got a text message and a phone call. 
uh, so I know there's a way to contact everybody. Isn't there a way to contact those voters who, I mean, you've got a list of the voters who voted and didn't vote. Isn't there a way to send a, an email or a text message or a phone call to say, hey, did you get a chance to vote or not? There's The Board of Supervisors has no authority to allow people to re-vote. That decision would, if, if there is a basis to do it, would have to be made by a court. So what's the process of doing that? You file a, someone would file an election contest and prove that enough people were precluded from voting and that number would make a difference in the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, board. Um, my name is Ethan Turner. Uh, I live uh, out by uh, Amador City in Dry Town. I'm a District 5 voter. Um, when this uh, all started to happen, I created an uh, email address called fairelections at usa.com and invited people to share their election stories. Uh, we subsequently had a community meeting where um, people came and told their stories. Um, some of those stories have been reduced to declarations, so these stories are not hearsay. They are uh, sworn declarations. I put together a, uh, uh, a uh, digest of, of what I've found so far, uh, and I haven't even gone through all, all the emails that I've received. I emailed each of you that digest this morning, and I've brought a few copies for the public, and uh, we'll go over a little bit of it right now, and as well as provide a copy of it to, uh, to Greta and, um, and the elections official, Ms. Grady. Um, this is not a witch hunt. This is not a, uh, uh, an effort to uh, blame an individual or, um, or to crucify anyone. This is really just about finding out what happened um, and to make some sort of determination about how many people were deprived uh, of one of their rights to either vote, have their vote counted, or to vote privately and to cast a secret ballot. Um, no, those, those rights are all enshrined in the California Constitution in Article 2, Section 2, 2.5, and 7. Uh, and there was numerous deprivations of those rights, um, and um, each one was preceded by a violation of the Elections Code. Uh, my little report here, which I hastily put together this morning because I had to work on uh, litigation I'm going through right now until 10 o'clock last night, but I got up and put this together very hastily. Unfortunately, it has a few typos, but hopefully it's helpful. Um, in any case, um, the, the fundamental basis of all these problems, um, which has been discussed, uh, is the insufficiency of the number of ballots. Uh, and there's been some debate about what those requirements are. Uh, I don't really think it's subject to debate. Uh, and there's Elections Code Section 14102. Uh, and um, it provides um, that uh, an elections official is supposed to make an estimate uh, based on prior elections. However, it does say in no case shall this number be less than 75% of registered voters in the precinct, in the precinct. Then it says, comma, and for vote by mail and emergency purposes shall provide additional ballots. This is more than, this will categorically always be more ballots than are required, um, but this is a, a mandate from the state, and it's an unfunded mandate that requires counties to spend more money than is necessary on printing ballots. That's an unfortunate thing, but it's, it is a requirement of the code. Uh, it's uh, quite clear, um, and um, um, I understand that um, the elections office does have to make hard decisions about where to spend money and how, uh, but this is not a decision that they're supposed to make. They're supposed to print 75 percent of uh, the voters for a given precinct, and had that been done, we never would have run out of ballots. Um, additionally, there's uh, a subsequent requirement of the elections code, uh, 14299, uh, that requires um, uh, that actual ballots, not copy ballots, not sample ballots, uh, not Xerox copies of sample ballots, be provided to each polling place within two hours uh, of running out of ballots. Now, it's true that the, board, the uh, Secretary of State does provide uh, methods for allowing people to cast votes uh, in emergency situations and provides a list of what alternative methods are allowed. Uh, and one of those methods that is allowed is the use of sample ballots or even copies of sample ballots. However, the way it was done here was not an emergency. It was an uh, artificial emergency that we created ourselves uh, by having insufficient resources uh, available to the, each of the polling places. There was, um, I'll just go through a few of the highlights um, and then I'll just distribute these reports. 
members of the board, and I'll leave a few here on the podium for the public and provide them to Ms. Jody and, and to Greta. So uh, I indicated the shortage of ballots and how that occurred. Um, one of the things that I found um, uh, it's a little bit surprising was that um, there wasn't privacy screening at a number of the polling places, so people were not allowed to vote in secretly. Um, this happened in Jackson and Plymouth, um, and that's under Article 2, Section 7 in Elections Codes 14210 and 14211. Um, they used communally uh, accessible tables so people could really see who each other were voting for. Um, the poll, poll workers were not trained on how to accept delivery of mail-in ballots uh, or, or how to properly accept provisional ballots. Um, they, um, some, some poll workers didn't understand that other people besides the voter could turn in a mail-in ballot uh, for them and try to reject them. Uh, fortunately, in most situations, voters were able to figure out what was supposed to happen and overcome the bad advice they were receiving uh, from poll workers. Um, but um, um, some poll workers uh, advised uh, voters to fill out a sample ballot and to write their names on them. Um, and uh, it's uh, expressly forbidden in the Elections Code um, under 14287 uh, that no one's supposed to write their name on a ballot uh, and, uh, and put no personal information on it whatsoever. It says, no voter shall place personal information upon a ballot that identifies the voter. Personal information includes a signature, initials, uh, name or address, voter identification number, social security number, driver's license number, et cetera. Voters filled out these uh, Xerox copies of sample ballots, putting all that information on there. Um, uh, that shouldn't have happened. It deprived them of their right to cast a secret ballot. So you believe that the poll workers should have told them not to do that? Yes, they should have told them not to do that. Yeah, and additionally, the problem with the Xerox copies is that there's no pull-off uh, uh, tab that, that, that links the voter uh, to their vote. Um, and so it's, it just, just should not have happened. I guess the question on that, should poll workers be looking at how people are voting and what they're writing on it? Absolutely not. No. The, how should they know there's a name on those well, ba ballots? Poll workers were instructed people to write their names on the ballots. They were advised to do that. And I have written declarations to that effect. So they didn't, and, and, and additionally, poll workers looked at ballots. They, uh, in many cases, they looked at them, flipped them over, looked at both sides before submitting them in the ballot boxes. I have declarations to that effect. Uh, additionally, um, uh, um, when people put in their provisional ballots with Xerox copies, there was no efforts made to uh, conceal the markings on those ballots before they went into the ballot box. And that's also required by the elections code. Um, I have that code section here somewhere for you. Uh, but they were just basically not, they didn't know what to do. Uh, and uh, training uh, uh, poll workers is expensive. I mean, there's, um, one, there's not enough of them. Uh, I'm sure uh, Ms. Grady could tell you how hard it is to recruit these people. Um, and, um, and I'm told that even on the eve of election, there was inadequate, inadequate numbers. And then you have to have them all come in advance, and you have to pay them while they're being trained. It's expensive. Um, uh, and um, it... Obviously, it needs to, um, more effort needs to be, and more money needs to be spent in that regard. Uh, and that's something that uh, Ms. Grady can only ask for the money she needs, and it's up to you guys to make sure she gets it. Uh, and, and hopefully that, uh, um, that if this third-party individual private contractor comes in and does an audit of the process, I, I expect that uh, that's going to be an issue. Oh yeah, it's got several people have mentioned electioneering. Um, the um, there was there was electioneering by private individuals. Um, there's nothing um, the elections official can do that other than call the sheriff. Um, but I'm told the um, sheriff's department um, w was called and um, by uh, poll watchers in Fiddletown, and uh, and they were told by the sheriff by the I guess it was dispatch. Um, they didn't identify the person who told them this, um, that that was not within their purview. I, uh, that's also something that should be looked at. Uh, if, if there's electioneering going, uh, going on and, and, a, and it can't be stopped by a poll worker, that poll worker does need to have recourse. Uh, and it seems to me that that would be uh, the obligation of law enforcement. Um, there was electioneering, unfortunately, also by poll workers um, uh, the, uh, in, in the Fiddletown District, uh, the Consolidated Precinct. 
um, where they were advocating voting for a particular person, a particular way. Uh, there was a, these were state races, though, not local races. Um, and interestingly, in, at the uh, Plymouth City Hall, uh, Mr. Oneto's name appears on the wall, <laughs> uh, which uh, should have been covered or removed. It's a thank you letter that was sent to him for his donations to um, students at Plymouth Elementary. However, uh, the uh, electioneering does prohibit the name of a candidate appearing uh, within 100 feet of the uh, um, um, polling place. For the record, I think you check that letter's probably been there, I imagine, probably three, four years, maybe sure. longer. Yeah, I mean, it should have been it covered like up. It's like I went and placed the letter on the wall. Yeah, well, <laughs> it should have been covered up or taken down and put back up. Uh, that's all. I mean, um, it's uh, the, the person who reported that to me had found it somewhat humorous because it appeared right next to the sign that said no electioneering. Um, uh, but um, uh, there, there's a, a few more things I have uh, here, um, and I'll uh, leave these uh, for, for, for the board to review on their own time and give them to the elections official. Um, and um, However, in the aggregate, uh, these problems are, are, are they, they can't be disregarded. Uh, they are substantial. Um, and uh, uh, your county council was absolutely correct um, in his in assessment, as you already assume he was, I'm sure, uh, that uh, if you're going to contest an election, it, it's, it's an action undertaken by a candidate who loses against a candidate who wins, um, naming them. Um, and the burden is upon the challenger, the contestant, to show that enough uh, ballots were um, either uh, not cast or uh, were incorrectly counted to change the result. The result. Um, however, um, all these voters do have civil rights, uh, and they do have private rights of action. Um, uh, and um, I'm certainly not threatening uh, to sue the county, um, but I will certainly assess the case of anyone who comes to me uh, with, uh, with theirs, and um, I'm sure there's going to be other outside attorneys who are doing the same thing. Um, and, um, uh, and you don't got to worry about me because I don't have time, so... Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, so I don't know the uh, one way that has been uh, put out by various members of the public uh, to unequivocally restore the rights of those who uh, may or may not have been um, allowed to vote, and we don't know how many they are. Uh, we've come across four. That's that's all we've come across. But but there's no way to measure the amount of people who didn't get to vote. I mean, we we just aren't going to know that number. Um, uh, and. Um, uh, and we, the uh, other people who were actually uh, uh, substantively de deprived of the right to the vote were those who, who were at uh, at least two different polling places that I'm aware of, where they left because there was no, no ballots, and they came back, and there was new ballots, but those new ballots did not have a supervisor race on them. Um, and there's members of the public here today who I hope will comment uh, to whom that happened. Uh, and they were given the option of either voting without voting for their supervisor or... Uh, filling out a uh, Xerox copy of a sample ballot, which no voter should have to do. So um, the, the, the questions about why and how this all happened uh, just cast a serious uh, dark and long shadow across the results of this election. Um, and, um, it's, and if it goes unresolved, it's just going to fester. Uh, and it's also going to follow the winners of this election uh, into their next terms. Um, so the, the one way that that uh, many uh, members of the public have uh, ex suggested that this be resolved is that we have this election in November. Um, and that um, because none of these people are going to take their seats until January anyway, uh, we're already having an election. Uh, it doesn't uh, cost any additional sum because we're already doing it. Um, and uh, I would leave that to your county council to figure out the legalities of that um, because I don't really know what they are. Um, uh, and especially in the absence of contests. Because I would think that would give the winners a private right of action against the county. Uh, but um, So it would take some cooperation from them. Uh, because if you're a winner, um, you have a right to be seated uh, and you have a right to be declared a victory. So uh, that will be between the county and them if, if that option is pursued. Uh, how, that, would, that would remove this cloud, uh, allow the elections of office to allow to figure this out, <coughs> carry out an election properly um, uh, and restore the rights of all those who are potentially deprived. Um, anyhow, that, that concludes my uh, 
uh, comments, and uh, thank you for time and attention. I'd be happy to address I, any questions. I have you might a question, have. and then I'll open it to the other board members and, of course, to the public. Um, have you contacted the Secretary of State on these issues? Because I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah. I mean, it seems like they are kind of the ultimate authority, aren't they? Actually, they have very little oversight. Uh, powers. Oh, really? Yeah, the, um, they, you can complain to them until you're blue in the face, but uh, um, as I'm sure your county council can tell you, um, uh, most of these uh, involve private rights of action that are provided for in the elections code. Oh. Uh, the, uh, so we can't, we're not going to get the Secretary of State to write in here and fix this for us. Board questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised. Um, got a lot of information here. But you don't have, you didn't give us the numbers of what you received other than the four people that were entirely denied the right to vote. I would think you'd have like a schedule showing the different issues that you yeah, have. And I, I, think, and I think you would have put that forth to, so we'd have the information. It'd be very helpful if you had. Yeah, and I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll continue to work on that, and I will provide that information to you. It's really just a matter of time. Um, I'm involved in... Uh, uh, five cases right now, um, defending Calaveras County against cannabis lawsuits, and I've been working 10 to 12 hours a day every day, uh, and uh, have not been had an opportunity to uh, uh, aggregate this information in a way that's um, really useful. <laughs> and uh, and I would love to be able to provide you uh, with the names of everyone to provide declarations, though they haven't provided me uh, with permission to do that. Um, and I and I expect hopefully I'll find a little. Um, little time here and there uh, to continue working on making this information um, presentable to you uh, in a way that's more useful to your elections official and to yourselves. Yeah, because I thought you had a meeting where people came, or I don't know if you were involved in that meeting at all. Yeah, I was. Yeah, the, uh, Yes, um, Saturday before last, uh, people came, and, um, um, uh, and I had uh, uh, three of the volunteer lawyers besides myself taking declarations, um, and um, uh, we, um, we got some more information, but, I mean, We've really just begun. I mean, we, all we have is a lot of raw information, um, and uh, and absent um, being able to uh, work through it all, um, just not ready to uh, to give to you. And the I would also encourage people to continue to send their emails to uh, fairelections at usa dot com. It's easy to remember. Fair elections, all one word at usa dot com, uh, and um, and I will be. Uh, aggregating that uh, information and presenting it um, to the board and to the elections officials. Um, and um, hopefully it's helpful. Um, and also, if anyone wants to do that, and they can indicate, please, whether or not they want their name to be or not. Well, thank you for all the work you put into this. Pro bono, obviously. I don't think anyone's paying you. No, they have not. <laughs> anyway, so I'm... Um, board questions? I'm I'd like to see that thank updated you. information. Yeah, when absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Other speakers? Were you going to distribute those to yes, the board? Yes, sure. Round them up. Should I give them to the clerk? Or? And one to yeah. me, please. <laughs> or, Matter, do you already have a copy? Oh, you sent us an email at 816. I think it was. Well, I won't provide them. It looks like you printed yours out. I think I have it, but I'll take another. No, I don't. So, thank you. No, that's okay. And it has contains typos. That's okay. Okay, who's next? Gary, is that you? Gary Rhinell, Creek 5 resident. I received an email from a friend this morning after 9 o'clock, so obviously you didn't receive this. <clears throat> and they asked that it be read into the record. This is from Mara Feeney, a Fiddletown resident. I'm unable to attend the BUS meeting this morning, but wish to report irregularities I observed on June 5th as a poll watcher at the Fiddletown polling place. I witnessed... Poorly trained or untrained poll workers who offered conflicting or incorrect opinions, such as that a person could not turn in an absentee ballot for someone else, and that a person who left their absentee ballot at home could not vote at the poll, that absentee voters turning in their ballots must sign the voting record book. 
poll workers discussing their strong political views and recommended voting choices in earshot of voters trying to vote. Residents told that they could not vote because there were no more ballots available. Complete lack of voter privacy or secrecy. Poll workers collected completed ballots with no manila covers provided. A poll worker filling out a ballot during his paid work shift, well after the polling station had already run out of ballot forms several times. Opening of the steel ballot box by poll workers. I believe that was prior to the 8 o'clock hour of the closing of the polls. Leaving the polling place completely unattended with a member of the public inside while taking breaks and removing all of the American flag and handicap voting machine well before the polling place closed. These observations led me to believe that the voting system I have trusted in the past is not secure. I believe that this election was so poorly mismanaged that Kimberly Grady should be forced to resign. We need someone competent to manage our elections and ensure that we have trained and ethical poll workers not contributing to a botched process that does not deserve our trust. Mara Feeney, Fiddletown, California. Thank you. Thank you. One else? My name is Catherine Evett, and I'm a resident of Volcano. I voted at the Lockwood Station 2. I was the very first poll voter on Election Day. I was able to vote, you know, being early, so some advantages to that. But when I got there, the poll workers tried to have me sign into the book upside down. And that was kind of disconcerting. And I said, are you really sure you want me to sign it upside down? Because I don't know where to sign. And we got them to, to turn it over. But um, I am happy to hear that the board supports bringing in an independent consultant to audit our election process and make recommendations for the future. As you recall, two years ago when there were problems with the sample ballots and ballots, I, I stood up before you, I defended the staff. I have 25 years experience in, in publishing and printing, and so I know that sort of everything that can go wrong will at some point in a printing process, but I've never seen anything like this, where there were so many errors before the election with the printing. I think that's probably due to some of the um, issues that come with variable data publishing and the only way uh, you can really tell what's coming off the press in a variable data job is to be at the press when the when the publications come off the press and so I hope that your consultant recommends that in the future that whether you go to all mail voting or stay with voting in polling places you've got to see what comes off the press to know that it's correct and there's no other way to do it other than to be there and see the documents. And it's too easy for things to go awry. And as you saw, there were you know, errors with the sample ballots, errors with the vote by mail packets, errors with the corrections to the errors, and um, then errors with the reprints. And so that really speaks strongly to having a better control system at the printer level than you have today. Um, I think it's just essential to restore people's faith in this process in Amador County. We've already, we have high voter turnout. I mean, in Blesser County for that, we always have had. But there's still 40% of people who don't vote. And if they don't think they're going to be able to vote or they don't think their vote is going to count, they're really not going to vote. So I, this is just seems like a, a critical thing to me. And I hope that you will move forward to ensure that we have uh, you know, a legally compliant, trustworthy voting system in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Big demand here. Wow. <laughs> I didn't see you. Hi, I'm Bonnie Landis. I live in Pine Grove, and I voted at St. Salva's Mission. Um... When I got there, the first words I heard were, you can't vote. What a shock. I'm 70 years old. I never had anybody tell me I couldn't vote. And then they said, we don't have any ballots. Well, since it's a, basically an 18-minute drive from my house down to the thing, I said, I'll just wait. So I became rather an unofficial poll watcher. 
And um, I waited. I was told that um, Miss Grady had been gone for 51 minutes. And I thought, well, I'll wait. I'll, I'll, I'll just wait. And I watched uh, one woman come up and be told there are no ballots. And she said, well, I, I, I'll, I'll vote in November. Those are people that you really can't count. Obviously, she came to vote and would have voted. And was she turned away? No. In a way, she was. And um, I, I really feel strongly about a secret ballot. My husband votes by mail. I do not. And um, I watched and I watched, and finally somebody was told after we asked, can we vote at another polling place that we could come over here to the registrar's office and, and fill out something. Well, the lady came back, and, and after that, somebody, I gather, from this office sent over sample ballots because they didn't have any of those. Well, my sample ballot, which I was asked could I use, I said no because some husband I know had used it to fill out his, his mail-in ballot, so my ballot was really, my words, quite fouled. Um, so I waited, and it was like an hour and a half I waited, and then I learned that it was a county-wide problem, and I thought, I don't want to spend my night here waiting for the ballot to come. So I went in, and I... Uh, and filled out a sample ballot. I was instructed by the poll worker to fill out the back, to fill out my name, my address, my phone number, and to initial the spot that's asked for uh, to be transferred to an email ballot, and to initial it because I didn't want to receive an email ballot in, in elections. And that was the instructions I got. Lady said an email ballot? Lady, the poll worker told you an email ballot? There on the form, it, it says, you know, you ask that in the future, you, not email, that you, re, that you receive. Absentee. Absentee. Okay. It, mail ba mail in ballots. And I didn't want to do that. I want to keep going to the poll. So I had to initial it okay. that I didn't want that. And so talk about lack of secret ballot. Like, and that's what kept me waiting and waiting. I didn't want to do that. But then I realized I stood a good chance of not being able to vote because things were not coming back. Things were not looking good. So I went ahead and did it. But it was really, as far as I'm concerned, just a really total lack of privacy <laughs> that my phone number is even on my ballot. It was like, Wow, this just does not seem right. And, and one last question. How, it seems like you're looking for a number to make things important to take an action on. That's just my opinion, and I just think four people is too many. I think one person is too many. Thank you. Get it down here to my size. Rebecca Brown. Well, I, I do have to say that I'm glad I'm not an employee right now of the elections office. I'm, I'm very sorry you all are having to go through this. And um, I would like to talk about um, my experiences at a few of the polling stations. And one in particular where the outcome of all of this made me feel as though we're being, yeah, I guess deprived can work, um, deprived of our constitutional rights to vote, to have a secret ballot, and, and to have confidence that how we vote is done accurately. Um, I, I had uh, my first experience with a provisional ballot, 
And when I went over to a polling station, I brought my spoil ballot with me and said I messed it up. And also, my dog actually <clears throat> messed it up, <laughs> tore the paper, so it wasn't <laughs> going to be any good. And, and so the person at the, at the table said, okay, we can give you a provis- uh, provisional ballot, and he assumed that I was a, a resident of that particular precinct, which I was not. I told him I'm not a resident of the precinct, but he didn't know what to do after that. And I had to wait about 10 or 15 minutes for the poll captain to lend me a hand because they were uh, deeply involved in getting the their new ballots, additional ballots, I should say, which is fine with me. I didn't, I wasn't in a hurry. But then um, I have a question because I filled it out and, and I got my stub and everything was put into a clear plastic envelope and then it was put into a cardboard box that was maybe about this tall and I saw that there were other um, envelopes like mine of provisional ballots sitting there behind the table in the open box. And I was, and and I said, that's it. And she said, yeah. And I kind of thought that there was the opportunity to put my ballot in the box and that it wouldn't just be sitting there in a public space with others behind that uh, poll captain. But I didn't know what to do, and I was in the middle of doing all kinds of other things that day. But it still kind of sticks with me, so I'm hoping that um, I can be advised of whether or not that is the appropriate way to handle provisional ballots, that the voter still does not get to put it in the ballot box, and if it can sit out there accessible to anyone who might come by or later on open some up and replace them with other ballots. You know, the possibilities are there. I certainly don't think that we have that. And the second point that all of my experiences brought to me is there was extremely poor training to the consequences of having, as we've heard before, people talking inappropriately, people leaving polling stations empty, people saying inappropriate things, and etc. So I'd, I'd like to check with you if you can answer my question about, about what's the process ballots. for provisional ballots. For provisionals? Mm-hmm. Well, this time, because we don't have the M100s, what happened before with the M100s is go into the big Ziploc bag of provisional envelopes. I can barely hear, barely hear you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> now it's at my height. <laughs> uh, and because they're dealt with differently. When we got rid of the M100s, which was this was the first time, those were supposed to go into the ballot box. Because then at the end of the night, the poll workers would um, open it up and sort, right. whether that's a vote-by-mail envelope or a provisional envelope or regular right. ballots that go in. So, so um, I should have had the opportunity to put my ballot in the box. Absolutely. And all of the other... Ballot, the envelopes that were there did not go in there. The other, the other question that I forgot to ask was, at 8 o'clock when the polls close or whenever they closed, uh, um, isn't it acceptable for an observer to stay and watch the process? Yes, it is. And if someone is locked out and not allowed to watch that process, what are the consequences? Consequences, but though no, you are allowed to watch. There is everything is can be observed as long as it's not interfering in the process. So there would be no reason why you shouldn't be able to sit there and observe them sorting and putting it all away to bring it back into the office. I think we need to follow up on what happened in Fiddletown at eight o'clock. Absolutely, we've we've heard that. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, I have a, qu- you. a question for Miss mm-hmm. Brown. Um, about what time did, did you cast your provisional ballot, roughly? Oh, shucks. <laughs> um, I don't know. 
Uh, you don't some, mind. Some, I know. I'm trying to, well, I was popping around to different places. Uh, and so I would have to say somewhere between noon, one thirty, something like that. I, why? <laughs> oh, I, I was just curious, but thank you. But what, why would it matter? Uh, um, I was going to have a question for staff at some point. I just wonder when, when you might have voted. Yeah, I'm sorry. I really can't give you good information on that. It was not in the early morning, and it was not in the late afternoon. That's helpful, Oma. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Next. My name is Gary Korematsu, and a few years ago, I was a election inspector, oversee the election judges, the clerks, the poll workers. All these people here are complaining that things are, there's violations, and it's not just a few. How many people are here are unhappy? Raise your hand. I mean, and I'm trying to say is that there's violations here that we should really look at by this. It's, and I'm not blaming Kim, Grady, because I was trained, and all these violations I heard, I remember we were taught how many feet we had to make sure people were not uh, advertising or promoting. Those things they were supposed to know. I don't know if it's because we have so many people, some kind of fall between the cracks and, and, and they forget, or they didn't, you know, they shouldn't have mentioned a candidate's name or had a sign. But we were taught how to do this. And, but besides that, we, there's violations. You said, uh, just question, I'm a little bit confused here. You said they shouldn't have a candidate sign. Are you saying poll workers? You know, let's say, no, I'm, what I'm saying is that when it says no. Uh, no, electioneering. no electioneering. What was okay. that? No yeah, no electioneering. I mean, I measured out how close the nearest sign was. I made sure where I was, my ballot place, we were supposed to be really strict on that. And I'm sorry that some, there's obviously violations. But speaking about the violations, I mean, I can't understand why legal counsel saying, hey, we're doing these things illegal. We have to remedy this not just elect somebody that may not have been legally uh, voted in. I mean, this is like, this is our constitutional rights. And we let, how can I say it, is that you, ref you refused to execute my constitutional rights, all of our rights for voting. I mean, this is just a basic thing that we all say. And I think it's, you know, it's to me, I can't understand why we should nullify this because this is not fair, not fair to, to, to us. You couldn't vote then? What's that? You couldn't vote, you're saying? I'm sorry? There's did you, uh, you said we nullified your constitutional right I would say right like, like this election is just a big joke. If you feel that these people who, who ran, and I'm sorry that they had to run, but, but I mean, in a way that, but there's so many violations here. The way I'm looking at it is that you nullify this and just redo it somehow. Give everybody the same, the, the chance of, I mean, there's, there's a lot of violations. I mean, I don't think just, just individual small ones. I mean, I'll look at all these people. This is important. And if you don't think it is, then I don't understand no, why we're elections, doing this. Elections are it's one of our fundamental rights. Yes, uh, I understand that. 
I, and I think it's, um, elections, there's, I think people are human. Um, one question I think I'd like to know at some point is how many people called our elections department to, uh, I think some of these people who were at the polls watching all day, and I'd like to know how many, how many calls Kim Grady had with people complaining about issues until the election was over. Well, I mean, how many called? I mean, that's, that's a point, something I'd like to have here from the elect, elections department well, at some point. Okay, okay another, I've, got some, I've got some people raising their hands, but you can't speak from back there. You have to come up to the Another microphone. thing is that we called the Secretary of State right away. Is this fair? Is this right? Within an hour, we got a call from them. Trying to What'd you call them. about? I didn't understand. You didn't it was state. like, well, for some of the violations. I mean, you have a Privacy Act, and that was violated. I mean, there's so many violations that, we, that we, we're listening to, and I don't think anybody's making up. Oh, the Secretary of State, do you know who, who it was that called? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not kind of curious. He's making well, allegations. But I'm nice saying is that they're responding to us, and... And I'm just saying that, that that should be really taken into consideration because I don't think any of us here is making anything up. It's true. Things happen like that. Thank you. Let's let okay. someone else speak. I'm sorry to interrupt you, your Mr. speaking. I just uh, would Mr. like to respond directly to Supervisor Onetto's question. I can tell you oh, that... We need your name. Oh, my name is Kate Heggy, and I'm a resident of District 5. Um, I can tell you that from approximately noon p.m. Um, that I and other people were in touch with the elections officials about what was happening at the Fiddletown polling location. Um, I, I, re I remember hearing that um, one of the election officials had advised uh, the principal um, electioneering poll worker that his behavior was a felony um, that, and that it should stop, but he was not removed from controlling what happened at that polling location. There were multiple incidents that took place after that. Uh, some people have discussed the fact that um, he would not, was, would not allow observers um, for um, to observe the breakdown of the poll after voting finished. Um, at that time, I contacted the sheriff's department, actually in three separate calls, um, because there was no redress for what was happening at the polling location. I spoke to Deputy Coletti, who told me that he spoke with his higher ups um, and that they informed him that anything that was happening during the election was the sole jurisdiction of the elections officials and was outside of the jurisdiction of the sheriff's department. I learned afterwards that the elections official is the niece of the sheriff. And when I come back, I will not take any more of this man's time or interrupt his testimony, but when I come back, I would like to speak to the perception um, of this election to many of the people who live here and how it takes place against a backdrop that indicates that our county government does not um, understand that they represent all of the people who live here and who pay tax dollars to uh, fund their offices and our government. Is there anything? Any other questions? Thank you, Gary. I'm Elizabeth Briegel, and I'm in Frank's district. <laughs> Is that four? Good morning, four. district Good morning. four, yes. <laughs> um, I, I voted on election day. It took me three tries to vote. I started at quarter to four, and I voted sometime around 7.30 at night. When I arrived at my polling place, which is um, the, uh, am the, oh, what the hell? American Legion, thank you, <laughs> American Legion Hall, um, there was a, a gentleman walking out and he said, don't bother, there's no ballots. Got to the, to the door and a gal, a volunteer of the poll said, no, we haven't had ballots since three o'clock. Why don't you go have a glass of wine? <laughs> 
and come back. Well, I'm a good listener. I went and had a glass of wine and came back about an hour later, and there were still no ballots. And so I asked for a phone number to call because we had till 8 o'clock, and she gave me a 223 number, which I do not know the whole number. Uh, at 6 o'clock, I called that number, and it was the elections office. That's how they answered the phone, elections office. And I said, hi, I'm calling to find out if ballots are here. The woman who answered the phone was extremely rude. She goes, what are you, what are you, why are you calling this number? And I said, is this American Legion Hall? She said, no, this is a voting headquarters or election headquarters or whatever her title was. And I said, well, I'm calling because I went to vote at the American Legion Hall and there were no ballots. I'm wondering, I thought I was calling there, do you have ballots? And she goes, I don't know. I said, well, I understand this is a countywide issue. Can you please let me know? She goes, well, I'll check on it, and I'll call you back. And she took my phone number. I didn't get her name, unfortunately. I waited 25 minutes and called back. Another lady answered the phone, and I said, hi, I'm trying to find out if there's ballots. And she goes, I have no idea. I just arrived here. I'm just here to help. I have no idea if there's ballots. And I said, well, I'm trying to vote. It's getting close to 8 o'clock. I want to vote. And she said, well, uh, we have ballots here at the county office. And I go, you do? And she said, yeah, just come down here and get a ballot. You, and I go, I can vote, not at my polling place? Sure, you can vote. Well, I didn't think that that was true. And so I went back down to American Legion Hall. And they actually had ballots. And I was able to vote. But you know, I'm retired just recently. My working days, I would not have had three trips to the poll. And I, I think there are, what he said, four people that were counted. But what about all the parents that stop by? That's the premium time after work. That stop by to place their vote, and they have children, and they have responsibilities, and practices, and all the rest of this stuff. They're not being counted. They probably don't even know about the meeting that happened. And they probably don't have time to come and complain about this kind of stuff. So. I'm here representing myself, but I'm also here representing them because I feel very strongly that when you take the time to exercise your right as a voter, you should be able to vote. And I also don't understand in this day and age why there wasn't communication. People in the office here that were here at he election headquarters had no information. There wasn't a phone number to call your polling place. Why, there's got to be landlines or cell phones or someone that could be designated. This telephone is designated for this time when something happens. When ballots are coming from Sacramento, we were told, and I don't know if that's true or not, or if they're being reproduced or whatever in the heck is going on, everyone at a polling station should have had that information. They shouldn't have n never walked out to me and said, I have no idea what's going on. That's ridiculous. This is the age of information. If we have anything, we have too much information. But no one seemed to be coordinating any of that kind of disbursement of information, including to the people that were working. You shouldn't answer a phone if you don't have the information about a crisis that's going on at 7 o'clock at night when the polls close at 8 o'clock. That's unacceptable. And I think that, you know, for that reason, we do need to look into this and make Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to speak next? And we do have a couple of public hearings scheduled at 1030, but they're going to have to be put off. Is that legal, Greg? Okay. Yeah, they'll just wait until the They'll just have to wait. Yeah, okay. I'll make it short. My name's Bruce Moody. I um, live in Plymouth. I did get a ballot at 6 o'clock. The ballot, the person to deliver them, left. She was headed for Fiddletown with the ballots. And uh, took the first part, turned it over, took the second part. There was no supervisors at all. I heard on the radio that there are five ballots in the county, one for each district. They are scrambled for alphabetical. I don't know whether it's for statewide or just the county. I turned that ballot in. Were those electronically counted or did they hands-on 
look at them. I don't know. But there was no supervisors on that ballot. Say six o'clock, was it you said? The, to the time, did you say six o'clock? Uh, yeah, they showed up at six. The girl left the lady approximately 30 plus ballots. She was headed to Fiddletown next. I don't know how many of them they used. I know there were six of us taking the vote right then. And she'd already left before we realized that uh, there was no supervisor on our ballots. So I don't know where the ballots, which district, and if they're electronically counted and they're scrambled, I don't know who I voted for. Their judge, you know, and all the different ones, I don't know. So that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you. I'll cut it short. Thank you. And I believe, Kim, they are all electronically counted, right? Yes. Who? Won't read them, and that's, that's when you get in the duplication process, or if, to decide the voter intent, if they, something was written in. Okay. Quick question, Please. because it's still fresh. Um, Mr. Moody was saying at 6 o'clock there's no supervisor on the ballot at the Plymouth at polling Plymouth. station. That was, that was me. Um, Kim had just, del I'm surprised at the 6 o'clock, but it could have been. I don't really know. Uh, Kim and I had just met at Sacramento and Latrobe because she'd picked up the ballots at our printer in, in uh, Rancho Cordova, brought them in, and we split them up there. And I went to, first to the um, Plymouth City Hall, which I believe, Mr. Moody? Yeah. Okay, Plymouth City Hall. And when I got there, I was concerned because as we all know, there is an A card and a B card. And so I was counting out to be sure that there was equal A cards and B cards. And I totally made a mistake, goofed up, and blew it. And that I gave them, I believe I gave them um, ballot type two, which would not have had a supervisor's uh, race on it instead of four. But I got the A's and B's right. However, I dropped them off. By the time I got to Terra del Oro, which was my next stop, they had called there. I then turned around after giving Del, uh, Terra del Oro their ballots. I turned ba over, came back. There were people waiting. So I was under the impression, I don't know at this moment if I was actually told this or I was just under the impression that um, no one had voted. In fact, I asked that, and they said, no, nobody had voted. It's okay. And we switched out the um, ballots, and then I went on my way, and they had the proper ones. So they probably had, uh, my guess, it's a round trip from Terra de Laurel. So what, 40 minutes, half an hour? I don't really know. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. And that, but that is exactly what happened, and that is the only instance that we know of that anybody had the wrong ballot. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Who's next? Put it down there. Yes, pull it on down there. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Floyd Salyer Goulart. I love this county. I've been here a long time and voted here a long time. And now I'm very sad and I am extremely frightened because of what we know about our country in general and all of the problems of people getting to vote. And now here it is in my county, Amador County. People can make mistakes ladies and gentlemen, but chaos takes planning. I'm fully aware, as we all are, of the chaos. Please, please, all of you, protect our county and the voting privilege in the United States. 
Thank you. Thank you for this Floyd. opportunity. <clears throat> Morning. I'm Sue Wilson Cowan. I'm a resident of Fiddletown. Um, very best case here is gross incompetence. Uh, I, uh, I'm a little disturbed by the changing stories that have been coming out of our elections office. Amador County Election Day ballot statement by Kim Grady said that they doubled the statewide turnout expectation. Here's what it says. Because Amador's turnout, let me read it. When ordering ballots for an election, calculations are made using the number of poll voters and an estimated statewide turnout percentage. Because Amador County's turnout is usually above the statewide turnout, we doubled the expected percentage. That was actually the second story. The first story that came out of the elections office was that they had used the 40% figure that they had used four years ago. The figure that I looked up online was actually 46.73%. The third story that came out of the elections office was that upon learning that the law, as we heard Mr. Turner talk about earlier, that the law requires 75% of registered voters will have ballots available. Then the story turned into, uh, we did that when you include the absentee ballots, which of course is not inside of what is, is the state law. So we've had this moving of stories. It hasn't been a consistent story all the way along, and that is, should be disturbing, I think, to all of us. And the same thing has happened with the poll workers. Um, inside this same Election Day ballot statement, because our poll workers are well-trained they were able to execute these plans and made sure the voters knew that anyone in line would be able to vote no matter how long it takes. Well, they, we've heard the testimony here today. Now, it was reported just recently, I believe it was the Ledger Dispatch that reported that the story has changed again. Now the story is, oh, well, the day before, uh, we had a lot of poll workers call and say, oh, I can't make it tomorrow. So I have a couple more statements, but I would like to ask Ms. Grady, were there poll workers then that were called in that just weren't trained at all? So why would you say that your poll workers were so very well trained? Yeah, come yeah, on. Please, when I come to this. We have three classes, each of which are um, an hour and a half long. Uh, they are every single time. These are normally poor poll workers who have come from the last election so that they are experienced. And um, the trainers, particularly the, the main trainer, has been a trainer since 2006 for poll workers. So well aware of what needs to be done. Um, and yes, there are times in uh, the reality is when people drop out unexpectedly, obviously because we want the polls to be manned, we have to find people who have not been trained because we have 12 hours, we have three days, whatever it is, to get them in place. What we hope to do always is to have somebody within that polling site or several people within that polling site that have already had experience that had attended the training. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, in this particular case, and I can't tell you specifics, but we've had the whole crew quit at one time. And that was because traditionally, 
we have hired, and traditionally, as in for a long time, I don't know, 10 years, maybe more, I don't know, um, have worked with the inspector, who is the person in charge, and said, why don't you get your own crew, and that way you know the people and that kind of thing, which has worked for a long time, except that the loyalty tends to be with the inspector, and so when the inspector retires, quits, become ill, whatever it is, everybody goes at the same time. So that is part of the problem that we had this time and have had in the past. However, because poll workers across the board tend to be 75 years and older, there comes a point when you start having a lot of turnout and uh, turnover, excuse me, and that's sort of where we are right now. We're finding that we have a lot of turnover, but we do have very definite um, training. We have training schedules and we have training materials, so they are taught. I've been uh, doing training, elections training, since 2002 or three, I think, and. Um, Tried lots of things in more than a few counties and things to help uh, poll workers retain what they need to learn. Sometimes it's very successful and sometimes it's not. And unfortunately and fortunately, these are very patriotic people who really want to help, but sometimes they feel that they need to have decisions made that they perhaps shouldn't have. I mean, they're human. But yes, we do train. Thank you, Greta. I understand human nature. But I also understand that this ballot statement that I picked up at the elections office is false. This was distributed to all of us and all of you and the news media because a lot of these poll workers apparently wasn't trained, weren't trained, and I have to say that explains why when I went to the Fiddletown poll, I had a poll work worker saying, we need to get rid of Jerry Brown and get somebody in there that doesn't have a D behind his name inside the poll. That's when my antenna went up and went, wait a minute, I want to have these elections counted Fairly, I want this to be correct. I'm going to go with whoever gets in and say that's America and that's the American way. And I look at that flag and I see blood on it. I see the blood of my family who fought in the Revolutionary War. There's got to be accountability here. And when I look at all of these problems... And I think about the, the single most important function of this entire county outside of emergency services is to make sure that these votes are properly counted. When you look at all of the laws that have been broken by the elections office themselves and the changing stories that we are seeing, I have no recourse but to please ask that Kim Grady resign her seat. We need to have someone in this position by November that we the people all can trust. I also heard an idea earlier, and I think it's a good one, and it, I believe it's going to have to be voluntary, and perhaps your county council can say whether this is even feasible. But yes, Mr. Onetta, you're an honest man. You won this election. You probably would win it again, but it would be lovely to see you and others who have won this election say, on the local level, let's do a redo. Let's do it over so everybody feels really safe on our local level that we have our votes counted properly and we move forward in unity as a county and say, okay, they made it right. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning. My name is Rebecca Korematsu, and um, I was married to Gary. I am married to Gary. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> this morning when you checked, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Last okay. time I looked. Um, I have also been trained uh, as a. Let's see. I would. I was a judge for a polling place in the past. I have received the training uh, for the elections. Uh, when I came to cast my vote, mm, you know, after work, working long hours, come to my polling place. They said. It was about maybe 6 o'clock. They said, we don't have any ballots. We haven't had any since 1 o'clock. We called three times. I said, well, when are you going to get them? We don't know. We haven't heard back. So I called the elections office, and I said, who am I speaking to? And they said, what's your name? Exactly in that tone of voice. And so I said, I'm Rebecca Korematsu of Volcano, California. What is your name? And so I got a first name of the employee, asked what was going on. They did not know. They could not tell me. They said, oh, ballots are going to get there when I need an ETA. You know, I've just come off of work in like 12-hour day, right? I'm a working person. I, I have voted in every election for, I guess, well, 42 years, so now you know how old I am. The, um, I voted in every election. I was not going to have my vote taken from me. They told me, well, bring a sample ballot. They didn't have any photocopied ballots. They didn't have any provisional ballots. I didn't have my sample ballot. So I don't know if you can... I don't know the legal definition, I'm not a lawyer, of what voter suppression looks like. But I, can, I believe that this was so mismanaged through a series of multiple issues. The lawyer who suggested that we have a revote in November, I wholeheartedly support that. And there were no winners. Wednesday morning because of the cloud that's been put over this election. And you deserve to be able to know that you've won fair and square. And so I just wanted to say the, the losers, though, we had a lot of losers. We had a lot of losers in this county. Every one of us, the winners or the supposed winners, but mostly the people. The people are the ones who were the losers in this election. Do you have any questions for me? Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Debbie. Hello, Debbie Dunn, oh, Pine Grove Debbie. resident. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair, first of all, for uh, switching the agenda items because I think before any of you could be asked to vote for certifying something, it'd be really critical to understand all that happened in order to get to the questionable certification. So I, I'm grateful for you do, that you did that. Um, because it also allows you to take full responsibility for that certification. And as Ethan said, any decisions made in regards to this are going to follow everybody well into their term, if not for their full term. I'm a little disappointed that Supervisor Forster isn't here today, and we all have circumstances, but... If there was any way to put off a decision here until he was allowed to be a part of the decision-making process, it, it might give, it might continue to rebuild some level of voter confidence here. Well, let, let me comment on that, sure. and Greg. Um, didn't you say yesterday that we have, the board has 30 days to accept the results? 30 days from what, from the polling day? From the election day? 
The election official is to certify the results of the count and deliver it to the board within 30 days. And once the board gets it, the board is um, required to declare elected those persons having received the highest number of votes. Right. That's a shall in, in the elections code. So but I'm saying we, that we, would also fall within the 30 days. So we could of put this off. Well, a quick call, call to the Secretary of State's office, and actually on their website it says all counties must report in by July 6th. And that Different. the state must, and uh, according to an intern, the state must respond to all voters in the state by July 13th. Two things that go on. One, they report to the Secretary of State. That's within 28 days, uh, 30 days to the Board of Supervisors. Different, different codes. No, but, uh, but the point is that we could put off this vote today to a perhaps a special meeting or something where if Supervisor Forrester was available. The board could, but my understanding is the, the certified results have already been sent to the Secretary of State. The state results. But I. The answer to your question is yes. If if three members of the of the board of supervisors want to put this over, still within that thirty day period. Okay. Well, so we'll what talk you about said, that. like the state results have been sent in, but the local results have not. That. They don't. This, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> they don't. Want no, and they, they need state results to um, tally the state the state vote. I can understand that. Um, local votes aren't going to affect the um, local elections aren't going to affect the state elections. Thanks for your input, Council Gillette. Local races, excuse me. Understandably, as elected officials, um, you hold voter confidence at a very high that bar at a very high level. So. How you proceed from here is, is critical to the level of confidence that will be retained in this county. Um, as an American, obviously the right to vote is the foundation of all democracy. Uh, don't need to, to educate you on that. But without the sanctity of a vote, an election, you dissolve immediately into anarchy. It is, it is the thing that separates democracy from other forms of government. So I, I, I have no doubt, after all of you have served at, at least more than a year, a couple years, um, if not many more than that, you understand that. Um, so not, not to go into a long history lesson, but uh, it, go, it does concern me as a not a multi-generational resident here, but many, many years, and a half a dozen, more than a half a dozen years sitting in this room, 2004, 2006, long before Ms. Grady. Tuesdays often are election days. To have Sheldon Johnson march up to this podium, usually in his red, white, and blue, um, statement of a tie and announced to you that all machines had been sealed, all machines had been delivered, everything was in good working order, uh, all of the ballots were in place, all the workers were on time. And he would come in after personally going around to several precincts himself. Followed up 30 days later at, at, in a meeting as this, proudly being able to respond these were the votes taken, these were the tallies made, the observers. It was difficult for me to understand how from that time that I witnessed him do that at least five times for us to have dissolved into something like this. And I can't imagine what, it would, what it's doing to the minds and, and thoughts of the residents of the county. Um, so what, it, what I thought, kind of a policy procedure person, was, okay, where's the oversight? Where is the oversight? How do elections, whether we can or can't recover from this, how do policies in the elections office get made? 
How, how do procedures get created? How, how did we go from simply decommissioning some electronic machines that used to be sealed and the seals were not broken until they got back into the elections office and the only people that did that were election workers? How did we dissolve? I, I understand in reading the law, the law doesn't force any of this to happen, but that's where we used to be. And we're not there now. And, and so, so then I think, OK, I don't remember election policy ever coming before you guys. And, and yet probably voter confidence is in your control. It's you, probably your job to ensure that we have confidence in our, you know, in our elections, and even though we have an elected official overseeing. So I don't know the answer to that, but I would like to know. And um, at some point. Um, I will say this, Debbie. Um, I don't think we're supposed to be running the elections department. I think um, elected board members are supposed to stay away from that. We're not supposed to be saying do this, do that. I think that would really be looked at as um, malfeasance by this body. Uh, and I can understand that position, uh, Supervisor Onetto. Uh, every department in every form of government has oversight, just does. So, Secretary of State does not oversee your local election, our lo local elections department. It was just stated by an attorney earlier, but that's okay. Uh, I, I'd like to continue if that's okay. So, um, one thing I've never known Amador to be, and then, and then I'll be done. Sorry, um, I've never known us to be out in front of things. <laughs> it's just I love my county, but we are usually the tip of the tail behind the log longest dog you ever saw. We, we just don't get around to catching up with the rest of the state in lots of ways. Um, so when we decommissioned the M100s to make a decision saying, oh yeah, well, um, we'll just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we're, we're gonna change to vote by mail. So we won't, you know, we'll just tough it through. And, um, I, I, that may been, have been what happened, but without any oversight, without any discussion from you guys, then I, I'm a little confused how we know that that was a good decision. So at any rate, thanks for your time. Thanks for taking the time today to listen to constituents, to your constituents. And um, if any part of the oath of office that each of you had to take in order to become a supervisor means anything to you, which I know it does, you're going to take all of this really, really seriously. And um, whether that means postponing your decision today, whether that means um, uh, moving forward legally, I, I would hope that there is enough concern here that you won't wait for somebody to contest this election, that you won't wait for a lawsuit or a class action to come that forces you to retain voter confidence. I'm hoping that you will step up and look at all of the options that might be before you and try to maybe get an investigation in here and audit something, but also figure out how to move forward. So thank you We are much. planning to do that. Good morning again um, to the board, and thank you for hearing my public comment. Um, <clears throat> I won't repeat what I uh, shared already. Um, but I will take questions on any of that if there are questions on what I said previously. But I want to speak now to this broader meaning and the consequences of this breakdown of our democracy, um, at least for some of us who find ourselves in the minority here in the county. Uh, this debacle took place uh, against a background that I believe raises an inference of animus. Um, well, while I was on social media in the past, I'm no longer on social media, um, I saw one of our county's highest paid law enforcement officers frequently and openly post about his hatred for liberals. He uses a pseudonym, so I will give him the grace of not identifying him here, but everyone online knows who he is. I received a campaign mailer from Supervisor Onetto celebrating his status as a good old boy, a term that implies both a lack of democratic accountability 
and that he came to his position of power because of his familial and social connections rather than his merit. But you're saying my flyer stated that? That's what good old boy means. I encourage you to look it up. Not what my flyer stated. So it you're, celebrated you're mis- your identity in the perception of people in Amador County as a good old boy. I'd like to state, means you brought it up a little bit more for the record. We said a salute the good old boys and the good old gals. And we also had in there, it was a term of, um, it talked about it doesn't matter if you're here for, I think it was one day or 100 years. It's, okay. how, it's basically how you... Um, treat people and what you do for I the don't see any anybody, point anybody is eligible for the status it said I don't see any point in this board debating a, a former well, she, campaign she just brought it up so I just want well to for, to for what myself. it's worth supervisor Onetto that's how it was perceived by many of us I volunteered for uh, his or your opponent and I can't tell you how many people told me that they are they felt their vote didn't count it didn't matter because no matter what, the good old boys would prevail. How do you think they feel now? When you look online, I will mention that you see that um, apparently among our elections officers' chief qualifications um, is the fact that her family has lived in this county for five generations. And so a third or half of this county might be excluded from the good old boys and the good old girls club, but we expect at minimum the legal and legitimate processes that guarantee our constitutional rights to a secret and free vote and a representative form of government. I haven't looked into this uh, myself, but as far as I understand, if there was litigation to overturn the results of this uh, election, that the winners of the election would be named as a defendant. And so I would like to hear from the county council why there's not a conflict of interest for Supervisor Forrester to participate in this discussion. Would you like me to respond yes please okay I'll, I, supervisor Forrester I'm sorry or Onetto Onetto I don't know why I, I said that say, I, well, I was supervisor confused. Onetto yeah. I'm so sorry yeah that's that was that I misspoke um, well the same thing would apply to supervisor Morgan or any person who's uh, on the ballot that's actually incorrect I think it's different because he would be a defendant named in the lawsuit well, because he because he's the winner well there's no litigation yet well but considering that there's the possibility of litigation um, and he could be a party to the litigation shouldn't he be excluded from this decision in this discussion no because what they're talking about is steps to take for the next election we're not talking about uh, a, a, a an election contest because not one has not been filed. Okay, thank you. Thank Can I you. answer any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Oh, go ahead. You have to come up here. If we are speaking only to the certification issue, do we wait till the next item? Yes. Okay. Very briefly, uh, I'm confused about one thing. Please, How you please could... share your name. I'm sorry. I'm Barbara Wool Lutchinger, and I'm your neighbor. And I'm concerned only about the math of this. If you can certify the part that is other than local, when they didn't get the ballots either, how can you certify any of it? Someone has to, you know, some of you people are very swift at the arithmetic. And I think you really have to consider, you have to throw out the whole thing. You can't just say, if, if like, so many percent of the people did not get to get their votes in regarding things that are not local, then they should not, that should not have been certified. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Oh, and, and one more thing. Um, I've watched Supervisor Neto uh, since I first appeared here, and I think he was the funniest, smartest, best informed person I've seen in public government in a long time. I disagree with everything, but I still have to give him good old boy or not, you know, uh, and I'm a newcomer here, that uh, even though I disagree with you, I think you're really knowledgeable of what's going on in the county. I appreciate and very that. funny. Used to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else? And if not, I'd like to move on to item 6C which is discussion and possible action relative to adoption of a resolution accepting the canvas of June 5th of the June 5th election and declaring certain candidates elected. Um, Madam Chairwoman, yes. before we go on to that, so yes. did we give instruction to, um, to um, staff to um, look into an inquiry? or an Bring back options in two okay. weeks. Yes, we did. And, um, okay. I just want to know what's the process for um, certification and our obligation as well, uh, and um, um, how um, you know this could potentially be challenged. What choices do we how, have? How does that work? Just for my and mine and the public's edification. So we're moving on to the next I, item. I guess yes, so. we're yeah. we're at the next item. So the elections code um, requires that within 30 days after the election, the election official shall prepare a certified statement of the results, so what they've counted, um, and submit it to the governing body, which is the Board of Supervisors. And that's what's happening today. Um, and uh, the section 15400 of the elections code uh, requires that the governing body shall declare elected or nominated to each office voted at each election under its jurisdiction the person having the highest number of votes for that office. So um, that's, I think, the board's obligation. Um, and, and the elections official certifies the, the number. So I don't read a lot of discretion into this for the board. Um, what the proposal that I heard was basically a, um, a voluntary do-over, and I certainly have never heard of that. I, I don't know that there's any authority to do that. I'm not prepared to advise the board that, but I'm, I'm skeptical that you can do that because, um, so if as was mentioned, the person who had the most votes in the certified count would have an argument that they should be they should be declared the winner by the board as the statute requires. And um, so if there's a question or people have concerns that would be, that could be brought, they would, we would have to certify it in order for the process to move forward. Yes, that triggers their right, right. to contest the election, which um, you have a contestant and then you have the person who has the highest number of votes would be the defendant um, and, and um, you know, so it's it's not that that I don't think discrepancies are not important, and but legally to set aside the results of an election, there has to be a showing that um, th there was uh, votes that basically were counted or should have been counted or counted wrongly um, that would make a difference in the result. And and based on the representations, there's there's some. Um, but certainly not enough to make a difference in any of the the races, the local races. So I'm not aware of any basis for the board to sort of short circuit that contest process. But that but would have to be the action of that goes that, to court. Yeah. Of, that, of that process after we certify. Yes. Okay. But please clarify for me, Greg, but I did hear you say that one option the board has right now today is to put this um, accepting of the results, put it forward to another meeting before 30 days is up? The board could do that. I don't know, unless the certified results change, that the board has the option of taking a different path. 
as long as the results are certified, they stay the same. As I read the code, uh, it's, a, it's a mandate to the board. The board shall declare elected uh, that person having the, the highest number of votes for that office. So whether you do it today or next time. What, what it really same sounds, result. What it really sounds like is you're saying we're obligated to certify the elections, and at that point, if somebody has a challenge election, they would probably go to court, and a judge would end up looking at all the information, the facts, and make right. a decision. You're not really certifying the election. You're, so the resolution oh, says you accept, accept it, and you, based on the certified uh, elections officials' results, you declare those that those people with the highest number of votes the winner, um, and then 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 you move on to the next phase. There is one. Okay. What does the board want to do here? At least one public comment, Chair. Oh. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> You're welcome, Tom. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot we're on to the next phase now, the next agenda item. And then, Cal Fire, we are going to get to you. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Tom Infacino. Uh, today, I'm speaking on my own behalf. I am not representing any clients. There's no dispute that there were irregularities in the June 5th election here in Amador County. The full nature and scope and effects of those irregularities are yet to be determined. At this time, all we can do is consider the possibilities from the limited data available. For example, we know that 40% more Amador County mail-in voters voted in this primary election for governor than in the 2014 primary election for governor, but only 19% more in-person voters cast ballots. Did we miss counting votes from 21% increase in the in-person ballots, or about 660 votes. We've heard testimony that's, that hours and hours uh, of, uh, for hours and hours at certain polling places, voters were not uh, able to make a vote. If there really were no ballots for five of the 13 hours at that polling place, how many people were denied their right to vote? What if? 72% of all the votes in, all the voters in Amador County wanted to vote, just like the 72% of the voters who cast ballots in Sierra County. Did we miss over 2,600 votes? Today, you are confronted with two conflicting election principles. One, enshrined in the supreme law of the land, is the individual's constitutional right to cast a secret ballot in a free and fair election. The other is an election code principle that even imperfect elections should be promptly certified to afford a smooth transition of power and the timely implementation of the will of the people. In the interest of timely implementing the will of the people, you supervisors can, in good conscience, certify most of the voting results for Amador County. The local races with uncontested incumbents can be certified as any revote would not affect the results of those contests. Those people earned nine to 10,000 vote margins of victory over the writing candidates, another 7,000 uh, of the, even if all of the other 7,000 registered voters voted, there would be no question that they are the victors. The races that could be affected by a revote are the races for judge, for superintendent of schools, and for supervisor. The two supervisors are key officers in our county legislative branch. The judge is a key officer in our judicial branch. Perhaps no single person has more influence on the future of our youth than the superintendent of schools. These officers should not have to try to govern throughout their terms, hamstrung by questions about the legitimacy of their authority. Also. Citizens in a republic must have the confidence that the branches of government have legitimate authority. 
I fear that voting to certify the election for these four races will do more harm than good. Mr. Onetto was on his way to securing a mandate from his district to stay his course. A revote could confirm this. Instead, if the June 5th vote is certified, he will have to live with people questioning the meaning of his victory. Certifying the results for Mr. Brown will not provide for a smooth transition of power, but will leave the legitimacy of his authority in constant question. Also at this time, the election irregularities can be viewed as an accidental mistake in need of correction. On the other hand, if you supervisors certify res the results of these four races, despite the election irregularities, then there is nothing accidental about that. By certifying the results of these races, you'll be intentionally denying voters their constitutional rights. As a result, I expect that despite your years of service in office, many of your constituents will begin to question your dedication to protecting their constitutional rights. On this subject, I want to note, you know, somebody came up before here and mentioned the fact that there are civil rights at stake here. And there's something you need to know as supervisors. You only have limited immunity from suit in civil rights, federal civil rights cases. As individuals, you may become uh, uh, defendants in those suits and be personally liable. County counsel cannot advise you on those matters. He can only advise you on matters as supervisor. I strongly encourage you before you certify these vo the, this, the votes on these four offices to seek in independent counsel, your own personal attorneys, and ask them about the potential liability associated with that. With regard to these four races, I believe that this is one of those instances in which two wrongs, namely holding an irregular election and certifying the results, did not make a right. I caution the supervisors against adopting the two wrong makes a right philosophy in this instance, for it is a very slippery slope. We are approaching the 4th of July when we celebrate a revolution with the motto, no taxation without representation. Consider what you will do if disenfranchised voters of Amador County decide not to pay their property taxes for the next four years until you allow them to vote for supervisor again. My simple point is, if you adopt the two wrongs make a right philosophy to your benefit today, others may do so to your detriment tomorrow. In conclusion, I doubt that this will end today. I fear this is headed to court. If so, please do not spend a dime of our tax money trying to defend disenfranchising four or tens or hundreds of good people in Amador County. If so, please find a way, if necessary with the assistance of the Secretary of State or the courts, to put these races for judge, superintendent of schools, and supervisor on the November ballot. Please prepare to do so as you prepare sample ballots and mail-in ballots and in-person ballots for the November election. We don't want to have uh, this wonderful solution um, messed up by having to have an expensive special election after, uh, because we're not prepared to do the right thing in November. If we did that, if we had that sort of an election in November, then there will be no question about the legitimate authority of the victors. There will be no question about the supervisor's dedication to the Constitution, and there will be no question that the constitutional right to vote remains intact in Amador County. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the good people of Amador County. Any questions? Nope, I just must commend you for speaking like a true barrister, well done. So uh, just a quick uh, ask of our county council. Um, if we didn't cert say we didn't certify the election, what would that what would that mean? Are we allowed to? We're not allowed to do that, are we? Right. Well, the, we get to certify the that, results. So the election official certifies the results. Right. You declare the winner of based on their certified results. Okay. And and the statute reads as a mandatory duty. The governing body shall declare elected, and I'm cutting out some bits, the person having the, the highest number of votes for that office. And if we didn't do that, what would that mean? 
will be arrested. <laughs> well, theoretically... You'll do uh, well in jail, Frank. <laughs> theoretically, uh, a person who had the highest votes on the certified count uh, could try to compel, um, bring a writ to compel the board to um, take this, what they would argue is a mandatory duty. Okay. So we're probably getting sued one way or another, Frank. Oh, well. Yes, Bill. Well, I'm glad I'm not an attorney, so I have very few words. And those are Jeff beat you by 285 votes, and Brian beat uh, his uh, opponent by 528 votes. If every vote didn't, if all those people who didn't vote, they'd have to all vote the opposite way from what the, those results are to change that result, and that is not going to happen, folks. These guys won fair and square. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank okay, you. what does the board want to do here? Oh, go ahead. <sighs> so it seems that we've, we've got clarity that it, because of this word shall, that whatever Ms. Grady comes up with is what you have to certify. So I'm going back again to Kim Grady. We know that you have been personally responsible for these problems. We know that you have shifted your story over time about why these problems have occurred. What are you personally willing to do to rectify this situation right now? sure of a response to that because I, I've given information about what we are going to do to immediately make sure that we don't have these things. Um, but I, I'm not sure. Right at this moment, I'm not sure what. Well, ma'am, to speak frankly, it's your fault. This is your fault. Are you willing to resign? Are you willing to do the right thing and leave your seat and give this seat to somebody else who won't, quote, goof next time? I'm not prepared for that, no. Uh, the buck stops with you. That is correct. So we will make some changes so that we can have a good election. What are you going to do before you certify this vote this time? That I don't I have to talk to county council oh, wait, because I don't. Let's, what? Yeah. Don't turn this into a We should yeah, direct let's, let's comments to the board yeah. and respond to All their questions. All I can questions. say to you is that I see that your hands are somewhat tied in this, but I think that it is very clear that there is a person in, who is personally responsible here who has repeatedly told falsehoods about her culpability in this and that clearly needs to be replaced. Oh. Now, I think we've just voted her in. Well, there's a process for that. So, Well, anyway. and what is that process? And I'll, I'll sit down, but I would like to know what that process is, please. It's recall, oh, right? recall. Yeah. We are going to do an audit. I think that's uh, something this board has decided. We, you know, there's a lot of um, irregularities. There's a lot of uh, issues of concern, but all the facts are not in. And so I think I have to be fair to everybody involved and not come to any overwhelming or overarching conclusions at this point until I see an actual study or report. And um, I think that it's our duty to uh, certify the results. And whether okay. Supervisor Forrester is not here, then really want to wait for him, that's fine, but I don't see a change in the outcome. Nor do I. No, you're correct. Any more public comment? Otherwise, I will... Consider an action by the board. Sure, I'd make a motion that we adopt the resolution accepting the canvas of the June 5th, 2018 elections and declaring certain candidates elected. Second. So, Greg, is there any conflict of people that got reelected voting on the certification of the election results? <laughs> I'm just asking. I don't know. I don't, I don't believe so. Okay, it's that's a, fine. It's a mandatory duty of the board. Okay. Um, we looked um, and uh, at the last election, um, all the members voted as well. We didn't have someone reelected, but we also had people who uh, were voted out of office who also voted to accept the results. So. Okay. 
the next election there will be three seats up uh and if if uh, uh Accepting there, those there'd results. be no way to have yeah. get a there, you'd vote. never have a, a uh, okay i've got did i get a second that, who i i seconded it seconded okay all those in favor and let me just read the resolution because we've changed it a little bit whereas the election returns for statewide direct primary election held on june 5th 2018 have this day been presented to this board by registrar voters kimberly l grady following her canvas of same as directed by the board now, therefore, be it resolved that the canvas of returns of the statewide direct primary held on June 5th, including the vote by mail ballots as delineated in Exhibit A attached here to and made a part hereof, is hereby accepted. Be it further resolved that the candidates listed in Exhibit B attached here to and made a part of are declared elected to their respective offices. That Exhibit B. Ooh. That Exhibit B is... Judge of Superior Court, Renee C. Day, County Superintendent of Schools, Robert Steve Russell, Supervisor District 3, Jeff Brown, Supervisor District 5, Brian Onetto, Assessor, Jim Rooney, Auditor, Tacey Onetto Ruin, County Clerk Recorder, Kimberly, Kimberly L. Grady, District Attorney, Todd D. Reby, Sheriff Coroner, Martin A. Ryan, and tax, Treasurer, Tax Collector, Michael E. Ryan. I think also it was um, June 5th, um, 2018. I don't know if that matters, but you, let off, you left off the 2018. Oh. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And I'm an abstain. I just can't support this. But it's okay that the board still has three passing it, right, Greg? Yeah. Yes. Um, no, it's not. Is it? Let's see. That, uh, yes. Four, isn't it four fifths? Not for this. There's no four fifths requirement for this. Okay, I'm sorry. I never saw that. I'm wrong. Okay. Um, but how long is your guys' presentation? Because I think some of my board members want to break. Hey, Cal Fire's but, gonna come back at a different meeting. Oh, gonna, you are. Oh, I'm so sorry. We it's, wore you down, huh? Oh, really. <laughs> Okay. Welcome to well, democracy. Let's, then let's take it. Let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back to item 6F, the Ion Sands Motocross Test Day. Uh, Supervisor Morgan. Yes. We do have the, the public hearings. We should probably okay. take first. Okay, we will. After the break. We'll do the public hearings in 10 minutes after the break.
and we are now over an hour late for our two public hearings, so we will go to item 7A and ask Chuck Beatty. Oh, yes, excuse me. Did you have a question? Come up to the microphone, please. Is there a question? We had items on for a set time, which was 10.30, which we're supposed to take at 10.30, which we were unable to do because we were finishing that. Uh, we'll be after the public hearings, the 10.30 scheduled public hearings. Well, it won't be until, yeah, it won't be until after we're finished with the public hearings. It's, it's hard to estimate how it really long it'll is take. yeah there's just I can have Chuck and Chuck and Greg verify that I sent an email last night saying there's too much on this agenda let's make it shorter next time <laughs> right I know well we'll get there We'll, we'll get the 6i. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Okay, item 7A. Chuck Beatty, our Director of Planning. Here, members yes. of the board. Chuck Beatty with the Planning Department. Uh, uh, this item is a continuation of a public hearing <clears throat> from originally from March, I believe, uh, to consider the Planning Commission's recommendation to approve a request for a general plan amendment from 40-acre density to ag transition, the 5-acre density, and a request for a zone change from R1A B5 single family residential and ag district with no further divisions allowed and the X special use district to, <clears throat> to uh, R1A single family residential and ag district for the entire property. Uh, the applicants, Pheasant Hill Partners, Lance Jaggers is the rep representative who was here. It's in Supervisor Hill District 5 and the location is along Last Chance Alley uh, adjacent to Bunker Hill Road just north of the Amador City corporate limits. Um, the item was well, the, the zone change and the general plan amendment were tabled back in March, or excuse me, continued from March in, in order to allow the applicant to have a qualified professional prepare, prepare a cultural resources study. Right. Uh, that was done. Um, the consultant found four uh, items on that property that were of that were of historic era, but only one item that uh, was eligible for consideration for the state's register of historic uh, places. And to that end, do you the, know the de I'm sorry to interrupt you. What what is the detail of that one item? Do you know? That's the Bunker Hill head frame. Oh, that's frame. right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, so your your uh, environmental documentation has been uh, is recommended to be amended to uh, uh, take that into consideration. And to that end, the applicant has uh, proposed to put about an eight acre uh, open space easement around that feature. Oh, very good. So the recommended action of the board today is to find that the amended uh, CEQA documentation uh, is, has adequately uh, addressed and mitigates the environmental impacts, adopt a resolution to approve the general plan amendment, and adopt an ordinance to approve the zone change subject to the findings that are in your staff report. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Board, any questions of Chuck? I admitted to Chuck that I didn't reread all these Oh, sorry. Will it be fenced? I didn't. I just heard it as a. Yeah. I don't anticipate that it'll be fenced. It's the year. It's the seven or eight acres that was uh, had been disturbed previously um, associated with the mine. It won't. It won't affect the ability for those the two parcels that it affects to be developed with with a house on each one. But it's kind of the westernmost part of of two of those parcels east of I believe. Excuse me, west of Fremont Mine Road. This is the Bunker Hill head frame. It's fenced already, right? On two sides, three. Well, yeah, you have to. If you came from the other side, you'd be on that person's property. Right, right. Or Not to the extent parcel. that's proposed in the applicant's final have map. Have to come up. Lance has a. I'm Lance Jaggers. I am the applicant on this. Um, actually, the the 
property sits at an intersection of roads, and there's the old, I'm going to call it cattle fence around it, the, you know, the three right. or four barbed wire. But I have fenced the actual head frame itself inside of that area to keep people, um, to keep people off of it and uh, where you can go in and look at it, but not all over it. Kind of constructive nuisance, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was just my own information. Thank you. Other questions by the board? I've got one on the mitigation measure. It talks about shall prevent ground disturbing activity and construction of new structures. Would that only be like basically stuff that requires a county permit, like a discretionary permit? The intent of the mitigation measure is to prevent all ground disturbing activity and construction of new structures in that eight acre open space easement. Construction for, for the purpose of constructing new structures. Somebody wants to plant a garden. I don't think we have the authority to be telling them they can't plant a garden or something like that, I would think. If, if the language of the open space easement, the recorded open space easement, says you can't plant a garden, then they wouldn't be able to plant a garden, but it will be subject to the specifics of that easement when it's recorded. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Nope. Public comment? No public comment. Um, yeah, close oh, the public hearing. That's right. Thank you. Move, move to open. I forgot to Actually, open the public hearing. I always do that. I, it's from a continuation. It's open, but I, I will need a motion to close the public hearing before we do an action. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Okay. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Okay. Now, any public comment? No public comment. Now I'll entertain a motion. Public um, a bit. Yeah. Public hearing is closed, so we're ready for a board motion. Um, I'll make a Clarify. motion that we find that the amended initial study mitigated neg negative declaration prepared for the project adequately addresses the uh, mit and mitigates the environmental impacts. Adopt a resolution approving uh, the general plan amendment and adopt an ordinance approving the zone change. Second. Okay. <clears throat> Any other discussion? And I'll just, I know this is a different agenda item, Chuck, that we will get to, but since we're amending the general plan, are we, and, and we have amendments in a, in a settlement to our general plan, is, is any of that affected by this? I would assume not. But I just thought I'd double check. It doesn't no, not in my opinion, doesn't affect the, the terms of the settlement. No. Okay, thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Let's go to item item seven B. You're up again. Again? Yep. Chuck Beatty, Planning Department. Uh, this next item is another public hearing continued from March uh, to allow again allow the applicant to prepare a cultural resources study for the uh, property as required by the uh, new general plan. That uh, cultural resources study was done and uh, found that there were no uh, historic area items or uh, resources on the property that were subject to um, inclusion in the California Register of Historic Resources. So the, um, again, the, the, CEQA, the CEQA document was updated to reflect that information and the requested action of the board again is to find that the amended initial study adequately addresses and mitigates the environmental impacts for you to adopt a resolution approving the general plan amendment and to adopt an ordinance approving the zone change. Okay. I'm okay, because the recommendation says, says continue, continue, to, a continue to a date certain. So that's what the that's recommendation right. says. Something's wrong here. So we're uh, dropped on. Kind of the same. Page 390. There's also a requested board action, though. I think it's what I showed you earlier, Chuck. I have a feeling this this item, the, the bulk of the item, the numerous pages you were talking about, yes. yeah. rolled over from, from March each time it came before the board and then got continued. I think that's a leftover page from in there. Okay, so what you would like us to do is do the same recommendation we did on the prior issue. Yes. We have it under like the requested board action is correct. Yes, sir. You know, three, four pages in. Right. Oh, right. yeah. OK, 
Okay. I'll make a motion to open the public hearing. Okay. All in favor of opening the public hearing? Aye. <laughs> okay. Anybody like to speak? Good afternoon, almost. Uh, I have just a question, a uh, point of information. Are these two separate? The, uh, the last one doesn't have a location listed on the agenda. So are they two general plan changes? Question, separately, and how many general plan changes have we done this year? I'll have to ask you to answer that. No changes to the general plan since its adoption in October of 2016. So this would be two that you're allowed of four in a given year. Okay. Okay. And these That's are a, two separate. Yeah, they're two separate, separate properties. They're two separate properties, yes. but there's no nothing no, on that, the. Uh, that was something I intend to talk to Chuck about is that, that next time we put an agenda item together let's make sure we list what the properties are okay yeah the address or the parcel number or doesn't something have those so oh it, I, I see what you're saying it's in the it's in the body of the information right but it's, it's not, not on, on the agenda the agenda item right 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 okay so yeah. thank you. I would just direct you to the staff report has the correct language has the property description um, Right. It's uh, along Fremont Mine Road, approximately one quarter mile north of the Amador City corporate limits. Right. I think the request, Greg, was maybe in the future, could it be included or something like that? So people On the look agenda, at it. so people can see it. But I'll uh, dig through the report. Yeah. Right. And we'll get that fixed. Okay. Okay, right. thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I, I'll adopt a motion to close the public hearing. Is there anybody else oh. that wants to speak? Oh, I'm so sorry. Public comment, yes. Hi, C Catherine Evett, representing Foothill Conservancy. Um, actually, I think under the Brown Act, neither of these items is properly noticed because there's no way for the public to know from reading the agenda where the properties are located. I'm not saying that to discourage you from going ahead and acting on them today, but I think in the future, it's really got to be in the agenda. You can't rely on the packet content you know, the, the, the Brown Act's pretty clear about that the public needs to be able to read an agenda item and know what's being decided on and what it pertains to. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. Fix that. I, I think it should be changed, but if you, I, th I think it's sufficient because if you relate back to where it's continued from, you will get to the property description, but her comment is okay. is appropriate. Right. It should Absolutely. be listed. Should be definitely listed. Yep. Okay. Uh, so now I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any other public comment? Okay. I'll entertain a motion from the board. Sure, I make a motion that we find that the amended initial study mitigating ne negative declaration prepared for the project adequately addressed and mitigates environmental impacts. And adopt the resolution approving the general plan amendment. And furthermore, that we also adopt an ordinance approving the zone change. And the following findings are recommended for general plan amendment and zone change. Uh, findings. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Finally dealt with those two issues that got continued a couple of times. Okay, let's go to, we're not, uh, just for information, I'm told that item 6E, the CAL FIRE report, will be put off to the next meeting on July 10th. And now we have item 6F, the Ion Sands Motocross test day for noise level and air quality data collection. And I know we have that. Yes. Yes, uh, Dan Morris from Ion. Okay. Uh, earlier, uh, I made a challenge, um, and I would uh, like to uh, address the uh, challenge. I 
give a copy of this to legal? Yes. And the, the challenge is uh, very uh, simple, and that is that um, the matter has not been the, the matter was is in the attack uh, committee level right now, and the and the matter has not been presented to uh, the commission. And um, meaning the planning commission. Yes. Yes. And uh, my uh, opinion. Uh, based on, on uh, the, the information I just provided uh, to council is that it should go to the planning commission and that it's inappropriate uh, for, for this, to this for it to be presented uh, here here uh, today and for testimony to, to take place on that um, that that's uh, um, my op op opinion and uh, um, I would uh, my recommendation is the matter would be uh, suspended and sent back uh, um, to to uh, the, the planning commission. Chuck, do you want to address that? I, I Chuck can. Beatty? I can or, or Greg. Greg. Okay, go ahead, Greg. So the um, the code sections that he's referred to deal with adoption of uh, uh, zoning codes, which I'm familiar with, where it does go to the the um, the planning commission first. Right, uh, and they make a recommendation. It comes to the board, so I don't think these are applicable to this situation. Um, furthermore, I th I think what we're talking about here is not approval of a project. It's uh, frankly, I think it's probably staff's uh, discretion in evaluating the project, um, and evaluating the impacts of the project. If they deem that they would like to see the 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 testing. Uh, the level of testing to determine the in the impacts of a project and it's going to uh, best way to test it is to uh, allow them to uh, run the motorcycles for a period to get the data to evaluate the environmental effects um, I think staff has the ability to, to do that I think they brought it to the board just so the board and the public is aware for um, information and it's my understanding is it's it's something that staff feels would help them evaluate the impacts of the project. And so you're saying that the board doesn't need to approve this, for that the staff has discretion to approve well, the, it? I think the, the staff has brought it to the board, and the board right. says don't do it. The, I'm sure staff won't do it, but um, what I'm saying is I don't think it's something that needs a public hearing, needs to go to the Planning Commission, um, even aside okay. from the fact that these apply to a different situation. If, if I may... Um a comment on, on that. Um, th there's a, a broader scope here, and it's a slippery slope um, uh, for for this. I, I think to to for the uh, this matter to go forward, simply because the um, construction of the, uh, of the track was done uh, illegally without permits, and this uh, particular situation would allow the would would give legal permission to to the mining company to conduct a test on a construction site that has not been permitted and gone through the permit process to, uh, of the of the county. So it's it's much more complicated uh, than than that. Um, and so so I think it it is applicable under under. Uh, the, these these provisions because you have the planning commission makes decisions they issue permits they they uh, appeals of uh, of of uh, uh, staff interpretation and enforcement of, of codes and they make those recommendations to this body um, that that um, then if this body votes to approve it and I want to appeal I've just lost an appeal process because it didn't go through the, the planning commission. It went, went straight to this body. And then my appeals process is the court of law. Uh, so so um, I, I, I wanted to just uh, um, give you that perspective and um, see if you had a response to that. 
I don't believe that allowing them to do the test. Well, my understanding is that members of the public have complained about the risks of dust and to get the data that's most applicable to this area, um, the recommendations from the consultant is to do a, a, a test. Um, and so, um, but, so that's the staff's recommendation. So I don't, and I certainly don't believe that it, it gives any entitlement to the uh, applicant to operate into the future. It's certainly at the discretion of the board. They need the general plan amendment, which is um, discretionary. It's a legislative act to change the general plan. So if the board chooses that that uh, it's it's not a um, an appropriate decision to have that that use there, change the general plan, they can just say no. So I, I don't believe there's any um, entitlement that they're getting, any um, uh, sort of precedent that gets set to 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 do this test. Uh and am I correct in, in terms of, of uh, the, the, I guess the question I'm, I'm trying to get to um, is the, it's about the process. And, and the process being that it should go to the planning commission first. Um, and, and Chuck and, I mean, the, the test and all that aside, that's what I'm saying. So, so under understanding that, uh, given the, the, that it's here, and it hasn't come to, uh, to to the commission, uh, to the commission, if this board were to approve it, and then I would lose an appeal uh, opportunity because it didn't go through. Uh, a, a step where I would have had a, an opportunity to, to uh, 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 appeal at a lower level. But I believe well, our council advised us that really the board does not need to act on this today, that in fact staff has the authority to go ahead and approve this test. And by the way, um, just give me a minute because I should have read the whole thing so the public has more of an idea what this is. It's a test day for noise level and air quality data collection. Suggested action to direct staff to allow the U.S. Mine Corporation to conduct, conduct a motocross test event with up to 50 motorcycles on July 7th from noon until 2 p.m. in order to collect noise levels and air quality data without further code enforcement action. So you... Yes, if this went to the Planning Commission, you could appeal it to the board, but the board ultimately decides all of these issues. So I don't think you have a statutory right to have it heard by the Planning Commission, um, but if they did hear it and then you filed an appeal, it would come to the board, but it's here at the board today um, and for, before them to make a decision. I think they can. Uh, that, but but your... your um uh, well, I, I don't need to, to debate it further. I, I think I've made my my point on that. But I I now have uh, t uh, uh, comments to make. If if there's going to be comments uh, on, on this, uh, then I'd like to proceed to comments. I, I have a quick question uh, because you it, it is an unpermitted. It was built without any permits. How does that affect? Um, Status of this project, uh, or do, does this somehow or another justify um, their, I guess, their entitlement or anything to to have that kind of uh, uh, operation there? To allow them to do the test? Yeah. No. They're still. It's still not an allowed use. Um, right. You're permitting a two-hour test to collect data on the the environmental right. impacts. So the board has, um, or the, and the planning commission has. The fact has that their their facility was not permitted. Is there any liability or any issue? Letting them. It, the board can say no, and they won't do it. And you'll get a sequel review, and it'll be based on models rather than data. And you can use that to make your decision. Um, it's up to the, the board. Could can certainly say no. Is. And I had an email, 
someone saying um, to uh, um, to Jim McCargue about um, where they might place uh, uh, sound recording instruments, us collection instruments. Would it be advantageous to them to project proponent to put them in certain locations? Is there any guidelines for that? Well, the w way I understand it is the county is uh, is hired would hire a consultant, and the county would tell the consult in connection with the consultant determine how to do that. Um, it's, and the it proponent would, would pay for that consultant. I that's correct. Would that come back to us for re further review, or they just go ahead and do the test? Come back if you want. If if well, you want uh, for review to weigh in of that. performing the test. Where they're going to place things and who the the details the the where the, the testing is going to be done the length of the test things like that we can certainly Baffles bring those in the motors well the length the is two hours and all that stuff I, I guess one question I'd have is in their air monitoring plan draft air monitoring plan it talks about uh, 250 sport events that includes up to 15,000 attendees per event. This test, we're not going to be allowing thousands of empl uh, attend attendees or spectators, are we? That's an no, error it's just a consultant's proposal. That's been proposed. Yes, we have another. I just want that understood, so, we're not, so we don't have a fifteen thousand person event under a test. Right. Did you want to say back. something, Chuck? And then we'll call on the gentleman behind I you. I wanted there. to point out that the reason <clears throat> we put it on the board's agenda is because we had taken prior code enforcement action. So we want a direction from the board or so to tell us not to take additional code enforcement action because I know that's what would be expected if right. from, from the public at least if we allowed the test and didn't do additional code enforcement. All right. Gotcha. Thank you. Absent that, we would have, staff would have used our discretion and allowed them to do the test. Okay. Okay. So let me hear from the uh, gentleman Well, I just sat down. I was ready to, to, to okay, go ahead. make my, I mean, I, I'm done with my challenge uh, on, on that, and now I uh, would just like to provide uh, some some input on, on this. Um, first and, and, and foremost, um, uh, I'm going to uh, ask um, about conflict of interest. Uh, with any of the board members uh, with Ion Sands Motorsport Park, um, with Burton Richards and Sweet Sweat uh, Professional Corporation, or with um, U.S. Mine uh, Corporation. Um, so, just so you're, you're asking if any of us I, individually have a conflict with us? Uh, yes. I do not. Okay. Anybody else? Not as far as I know. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, the uh, resol resolution does speak uh, to uh, a test, and I think there's a, a very uh, a lot of gaps in that. Um, there's there's um, currently the way the way it's uh, arranged is that the mining company um, has their own consultants, and those consultants uh, have. Per Produce the reports so that the, the, they are not being paid for by the county. Uh, is my understanding that they, they were being paid directly by uh, U.S. Mine. Um, in, in terms of of the uh, tests um, that that are going on, my understanding there's no staff oversight from the county there. Um, so this this is um, th without any oversight. Uh, we we set the the parameters up uh, for uh, the meters to, to uh, come read what they read, but there's no nobody there from the county to verify um, that that they um, that these things. Um, the um, there's dust uh, uh, issues here. There is. Um, uh, no soil test, and I think soil test is important because right specifically off of the uh, website of this uh, company uh, is uh, um, uh, uh, documents that uh, specifically indicate that there's cancer-causing elements uh, in, in the soil. 
uh, silica, uh, which is a, a 60 percent, according to, to that information, I think uh, it, it is appropriate to do a, a soil test. Um, specifically, the designated area uh, um, uh, where these bikes are going to run. Yes, they have a, a, a track, but they have more than one track um, uh, out there. They have um, um, so virtually almost 3,000 acres that, that they've put a, uh, that there's, uh, they, they've run uh, eight um, uh, four wheel, they have a, like a, a two, two or three mile four, uh, uh, track out there as well. So, so where the, uh, this is going to, going to be um, uh, um, put in place, um, this. Um, well, I think isn't that going to be part of the the ultimate project where they're going to have their tracks and everything when the project actually comes forward. Um, just to, I guess, measure sound and I, dust. Yes, I I understand. What I'm saying is, from a monit uh, like, w from a, um, a practical standpoint, in in terms of of uh, how how this is 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 moving forward, um, it, it's just yeah, in, gathering gathering information. But part of that is how uh, the environment is is uh, um, um, being monitored, um, and so in addition to that, there's a, a, a mitigation of dust um, that takes place as part of that, um, and the mitigation uh, of the dust uh, involves water, and and so um, in this, uh, I I didn't see that there is uh, anything more than that, that they're going to put water on it, but where does the water come from? Uh, there's, there's some mining ponds uh, on the property, um, and are those, uh, are those waters um, uh, uh, contaminated, or, or are they uh, clear? Where, does it, where do they get supply from? I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but is that really part of what we're here to it talk about today? It should be. Well, no, we're here uh, to talk about this study. We're just talking about the, the air, test air today. Quality test, not I, the project. I understand the the noise. So but if you I understand, that should be part of the project going forward, or this, the other studies. Well, if you if you collect the, the the data and and uh, you you have uh, no uh, understanding of what. Um, um, how much water has 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 been put on the tr track in advance? Um, uh, all of these things are imp important pieces of this because it and and whether they have uh, 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 mufflers on the bikes, how many bikes they have, what uh, uh, are, what uh, size engines the bikes are. I mean, you get into a whole litany of uh, of things here. And what I'm saying is the way this is, is, is put together, there are not these checks and balances currently. Well, um, maybe our, our planning director can um, address some of that. You know, are, are the number, the types of bikes, uh, that engine size and all of that, the noise, the whether they have mufflers or not, is that part of the study? You know, we can look into that. Yeah. Uh, but, so, I, but I think we need to keep focused on on this part. Are they going to be spraying water on the track during the time? That would be good to know. Yeah, all all of those the, the, those those things. What I I'm uh, going to um, make up a, a point here uh, about this is that this is also going to come up as an amendment amendment to the uh, general plan. And why there's not an environmental um, uh, impact re review uh, um, in this th this piece because you have a litany of of uh, 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 things you have traffic you have uh, noise you have uh, all of this that, that that's involved in, in this and that piece of it. Uh, most certainly, to, to meet the test under the general plan is going to be uh, need to be made. So, um, I will. Uh
Yeah, I'd like uh, uh, Chuck, are you still here? Can you come up and address some of this? Um, it probably would have been best had Chuck kind of laid out the project first before we got into the nuts and bolts. Thank you again. Um, I'm not sure where to start after all of that, but um, as far as you know, as far as the, the the motorcycles themselves, uh, I planned on being at the event or at the, the at the test site uh, to verify that they didn't use mufflers. That you know, spark arresters at best would would be appropriate on the bikes, but but that's it that the um, size of the motorcycles used or the engines used are generally in the 250 to 400 cc range so that they're not out there with mini bikes trying to fudge the test results. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's common for, the, for these types of events to spray, the, the, to spray the, um, the track prior to and during uh, events that I would expect that they would do that anyway. Um, it's, they're just the draw of that location water. is wet sand. They're gonna use water from the the open pits around there? Right, that's what they've done in the past when it was open on non-authorized days. Has there been an environmental review? This, the results of this test will be included in the ongoing re environmental review that, that we're doing, so. Comprehensive EIR being done? Well, if it gets to the, if the Planning Commission determines or it's appealed to the board and the board determines that it needs an EIR, then that's the direction we'll go at. Right now, we're looking at a mitigated neg deck. Okay. Other questions, Frank? Hello, gentlemen. Hey, let, let me open it to the public, please. Comments on this? Oh, yes. Got down. I couldn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Cipher with U.S. Mine Corps. And I just uh, probably not applicable here, but we actually are in the middle app of the application process for this proposed project. So we have done traffic studies, environmental studies, noise studies. We've already done air studies, but because of the public concern for the noise and the silica sand and the dust specifically, we're asking to do the additional testing to either alleviate or confirm the concerns. Um, so obviously at some point this will go to the Planning Commission to approve or deny everything. Is there going to also be a study of the water to the? Yes, we're under regulation from uh, the water board, from the county, from, you yeah, know. but from the open pits to spray on? Yeah, it's a mill pond. It's a, it's a, it's not an open pit. It's not like a waste pond or anything. I don't, I don't know how to so, describe yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand. And specifically for the dust study, of course, we're going to, you know, the mitigation is to wet it down, keep it, you know, keep it moist and stuff. But however, part of our proposed dust study is a baseline period before, during, and after for several days in either direction, um, because that way you'll get, you'll take into account dust from mining activities, dust from, you know, road vehicles, dust from whatever other activities are in there. So it's not just, we're not just taking that two hour period and giving you saying, look, there's no dust. Um, and the one thing, sir, uh, Oneto, that, uh, Mr. Oneto, that you had stated, I think there's some confusion too. Our initial application January of last year initially was calling for larger events. We met with county planning several times and some other folks in the county, and we scaled it down to, if you look at the revised application in April of 2017, where it would be a members only, no more than 50 bikes at a time. There'd be some testing. There'd be, you know, some, there'd be use of it daily, but there will be no large events. There will be no, you know, 15,000 spectators or anything like that. That's, people are holding on to that from the initial application, and that's not what we're asking for now. I don't, I don't Thank have you. A, that before me, so. Any other board questions? So you, you, how many spectators do you hope to have in the future? We really don't plan on any spectators as a testing facility and with members, if it's limited to 300 members, no more than 50 bikes at any one time, you're probably gonna have some crew members, maybe some family members, but no spectator events. Um, so it's kind of like a training yes, facility? Yes, training facility. And then that's the other issue too. I, I know there's concern about what we're gonna do on testing day, and as Chuck said, he's gonna be out there. But we're actually shooting for a worst case scenario. 
that's why we're taking 50 motorcycles on that day and running them for two hours, you know, hard so that the dust and the noise can be monitored properly. And as far as the monitoring locations, those were placed under proposals, which were agreed uh, with Chuck and Jim Hargue and, uh, and Mike Israel, as far as the locations. Um, we put them at our property lines close to subdivisions and down to the south um, on 88. So those have all been discussed as well um, as, as far as this testing. Okay. And would you be amenable to moving any, any of those locations if staff decided a future point they want to move them? Yes, and that's the other issue. I, I know that there's some discussion of, of the tracks and everything. Um, the location, part of where it is right now is because it's a general plan and zoning change, so it, it would have to be a new parcel for that. But if that doesn't work, because we do have so much you know, land, if we needed to move it to the south or to the west or wherever to, to mitigate the noise as well, that would be something we'd have to change our, our boundaries, but yes, we would. Looks like you have some, a lot of your monitoring stations are project and I own. It appears map, right? Yes, sir. Uh, Wildflower and then up off of uh, Hunter Lane by the road tracks. Those are two locations, one right at our site entrance off of 124 and then another location down 88 and uh, 124. They're actually pretty far off the property in some cases. No, that's those. That's all our property. All on your property. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. We were just trying to. What are you uh, going to monitor for, monitor for? Just particular for the noise and the particulate, the respirable uh, silica. Identify the particles. No, they will. We uh, there's a uh, independent consultant um, who, again, we've worked with the air district, and uh, we've all come to agreement. It's not like we're just going out and finding someone and. And hiring them to come and do good numbers for us. Okay. Do you do you measure? They yes, he will, and that's that's one of the things. As far as uh, I know, the soil samples were brought up. That again is is looked at as well as as a part of the total end end study and results. Other questions, Jim McCargu, Do you have anything you want to add? Good afternoon, Jim McCarty, Air Pollution Control Officer. Um, it's been pretty well covered, and I just wanted to mention that um, you know this is being uh, this this trial run day is coming out of a recommendation from the Technical Advisory Committee, which consists of uh, planning, of environmental health, public works, um, Amador Fire protection district, building department, the air district, my department, and then we also have had um, consultation with the public health officer. So initially, um, and by the way, the consultant is the air district's consultant and is paid for by the air district and is contracted by the air district. Um, I wanted to clarify that. It's just for the air part though, right? They won't be doing the noise? Uh, the, the noise is separate. Um, but but that's a separate consultant <clears throat> that's doing that. But your point is um, that it is the county overseeing at least yeah, the air part. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so um, the um, uh, initially we had the consultant do a um, uh, issue a technical memorandum, which was kind of a modeling study based upon. Um, several variables that were input into a computer program and there was a report produced well because of the concerns that have been raised with the air quality we decided to err on the side of caution and do our due diligence and therefore actually have real live conditions and that's what this trial run is is actually real world conditions that we can then take a look at you know what actually is happening on the ground so um you know it from the air district's perspective we're willing to rest upon the technical memorandum that's already been issued but again we wanted to go a step beyond and do our due diligence so that's where this has come from and it's actually come from um, these individuals that have brought up these concerns and in, including um, Dan who spoke earlier um, there's concern with the dust so um, that's why we're doing it 
And um, there is going to be staff present. And as far as sampling the soil, that's what these monitors are. They're collecting particulate matter, 10 microns, and then they're going to a lab, a certified lab, to be, then be tested for crystalline silica. So um, I just wanted to offer those clarifications. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Is that the only concern is silica? That's, that's the main concern, but of course. No other um, hazardous materials at the site? That's, we're not testing for anything else at this point except the crystalline silica and, of course, the particulate matter. So that, that's, you know, we'll get a report on what the actual PM10 is. One thing I would say, too, are you, are you going to go out and look at the actual sites, especially for the noise, to make sure that it's not, not down in a draw or something like that, so you're getting a, you're getting a pretty representative sample or, um, location? Yeah, and the, the noise I can let Chuck speak to, but just as far as the uh, locations of the monitors, again, these have been developed um, with our consultant who has proposed the plan and then reviewed by all of us on the technical advisory committee, including the public health officer. So we have actually uh, modified the locations and had discussions at length exactly where these these monitoring uh, stations should be. So yes. Jim, is it Ray Kapai doing the? Yes, it is. He's worked for, what, 15, 18 years? Uh, for a long time, yeah, that's correct. So he's got a great yeah. track record. All right. Chuck? I, I just wanted to point out that the uh, location of the noise collection data and the air collection data will be at the same locations. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Other board look. Other board locations, no. <laughs> I'm getting tired. <laughs> Other board questions, and if not, public? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Catherine Evett for Foothill Conservancy. Um, I know the Technical Advisory Committee has been looking at this, and I've looked at some of their materials. I think that having a real-world test is a really good idea, but I'm concerned about the process that's going on here. It seems to me when you have potentially significant impacts, and there have been several identified by TAC in the initial study, that the proper thing to do would be to recommend a full EIR for the project and then have the studies done as part of the EIR with a consultant selected by the county, not with a noise consultant selected by the applicant or with the applicant involved in the design of the, of the study. Um, as far as the soils go, I'm, I'm curious whether there's any naturally occurring asbestos in that area that's in kind of the belt where, where the chrysotile asbestos is in Amador County. And again, I just, um, 300 cars sounds a lot better than 1,500 people or 300 members, but 300 members worth of cars in I own is a pretty significant traffic impact in I own. And so if instead of kind of piecemealing the analysis here, you actually, uh, the TAC went ahead and recommended that an EIR be done and the county exercised its prerogative to choose its own EIR consultant rather than letting the applicant choose it, which is an option the county can exercise, then the EIR could look at the full range of studies that needs to be done, that need to be done, that would include not only the air quality and noise, but traffic and any other analysis. Biological resources are a big issue in that area. It's the one place where I own rare plants exist. Um, there are cultural resources issues, potentially, and all that should be evaluated in an EIR. So it, to me, it seems evident that the place to do the testing is under the auspices of the EIR and the EIR consultant completely controlled by the county but paid for by the applicant. Thank you. Um, what did you yes, need? Uh, Jim, uh, is there any effort to test for asbestos? The asbestos, uh, we did discuss the asbestos at length in the ultramafic rock formations that are also referred to as the asbestos belt are due uh, east of this location. So we, we typically do not find asbestos in this area. Um, now, having said that, um, because we're, we've got these monitors out there, we're collecting um, PM10, um, 
I, I don't think it would be a problem to have them also do analytical for uh, asbestos fiber. Um, we're doing it for the crystalline silica. That was the biggest concern. Um, uh, but um, I think we certainly, uh, I, will, I will definitely discuss uh, with the consultant, um, you know, the, the asbestos. Uh, I think, you know, it makes sense to, to check for it, but typically it's not found in that area. Well, uh, also, uh, Chuck, um, why is it that uh, we didn't want to do a, why didn't the TAC committee want to just do a full EIR? Full EIR, yeah. Uh, we, we felt that we could, I mean, the biological studies have been done, those were turned in, so it was a traffic study. Caltrans has weighed in on the traffic impact. So, you know, we, I, I think we've, we've done quite a bit of evaluation on the project. Um, we, I think we still need this real-world worst-case scenario uh, in order to adequately respond to the air quality and the noise pollution issues. The whole site, um, well, it was a mining operation, basically. The area where the, where the track is, where it's proposed to be, is a, is a former mining site. Some of it pre-SMARA, some of it was reclaimed. And it, so are there cultural resources there? Right. It's a previously disturbed mining site. Um, and what about the biological impact? Right. Is that biological studies showed there were no um, resources of concern in the area where the track is located. If you look at figure two, I mean, it, it's got it's got a location there, and all, all those yellow areas and blue areas you see, that's that area's been extensively uh, mined for silica sand, um, clay. All, all kinds of minerals. I mean, it's basically it's a it's a quarry. True. However, um, what about the? I guess we'll know from these air studies if the material might flow into other re, other parts of the outside of the the property itself, right? Jim can answer that, but that's part of the modeling that will be done is to okay. determine pathways. Yeah, and that. That's why we're, um, you know, being very careful about the selection of the monitoring locations to make sure that we're looking at it as far as protection to the residents that live in, nearby, as well as uh, taking into consideration the prevailing winds and the environmental conditions. So you would, you would then be able to look at any impact to not only people but the you know, biological impacts as well to. Whatever the impact is, we'll be able to see where it is and, and what it's doing. Chuck, I have to ask you, um, what is the advantage of looking at, at these environmental impacts in pieces, as you say you've already started to do, instead of doing an entire EIR? We had concerns from the public about noise pollution and air pollution, particularly crystalline silica. That's, that was, that's the whole intent of doing the... Uh, doing the test day just right. to make sure that we have data that shows at a, at a worst case scenario over two hours what kind of noise and what kind of dust is the project going could could produce yeah it might be fair to this this way here if what appears to be maybe a big issue can be addressed halfway economically by the proponent and if it's a real big problem maybe they just say hey we're, we're done and, and walk away whereas if you have to do an EIR, they're going to have to spend a whole lot of money just to get the first base statement. It would be a fair statement that EIR is going to cost a considerable amount of money that they would have to reimburse the county to have prepared. Um, this, this is a step in trying to evaluate two parameters that may or may not require an EIR in the future. It also may, we may determine from, from this information that there are a certain number of hours that they can operate in a given year, and it's not eight hours a day, 365 days a year. There may be a certain number of motorcycle or track hours um, that they can operate in order not to exceed any thresholds on uh, particularly air quality. Also, something else possibly um, the planning commission could, could just turn it down for, for whatever reasons or approve it for whatever reason. The whatever, discretion, whatever reasons. the use permits at the discretion of the commission unless it's appealed to the board and the zone change 
and general plan amendment are recommended by the commission and ultimately uh, determined by the board. I guess maybe more for the public and maybe only for my own edification a little bit. Along this way, the county could still ask for more information. More, Certainly. Couldn't, couldn't we? Certainly. Yeah. So, I mean, this just kind of, I think what the way I see this is this allows the proponents to kind of put their toe in the water without having to jump in. How hot it is. Or cold. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, any other members of the public? My name is Mitzi Windley, and I've been a resident in my own for over 35 years. I um, wasn't prepared to speak. I spoke at the TAC meeting, but nobody is really addressing how horrific the noise is. If I moved next door to an airport, I wouldn't complain about airplane noise. But this is our quality of life that we have lived there. And the Sunday that they ran, I don't know what track they ran on. I don't know where they ran. But I had clients hear it all the way out to Comanche. Not that it bothered the customers in Comanche. It did not bother them, but they could hear it all the way to Comanche. On Edgebrook Drive at the golf course, especially on Edgebrook Drive, it sounded like it was in their backyard. I don't care if they want to run it for 10 minutes a day. The noise is horrific. I hope everybody remembers that. I hope that the county gets involved in the noise study because the, the mind doing the noise study is ridiculous without the county being involved. Um, and like I said, I don't care about hours, 15 minutes, an hour, whatever. It's changing our quality of life. I am also a realtor that I have emails, and I've spoke to TAC about it. I've lost deals just to the proposal of this track because they don't want to have any part of it. Most of them were engineers, knew what was involved, and didn't want to be involved. <coughs> So like I said, I'm basically here because I have clients that are really upset. I'm upset. None of these people that want to put this track in live next to this track. And it's going to mess with our quality of life. And I'm opposed to it. And I just want you to know how bad it is when they did run it. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Chuck, the county is involved in the noise study too, right? We didn't, we didn't get to that point. What the applicant okay. has proposed is for the noise consultant to conduct, um, to collect data at the same locations that we collect air data, but to do that on 30-minute um, increments at those locations over the two hours. Our recommendation is that those be collected at those four locations continuously for the two hours. Um, there's no, it's, it's not a, but it's not a reimbursement agreement with the county where we've hired the consultant or we'll hire the consultant and they would reimburse us. It's being directly handled by the applicant. Oh, uh, okay. But the, the county was involved in where the monitoring the locate, sites, yes, the sir. locations right. of okay. monitoring. Okay. Other and, members and of the, the, excuse me if I could, the idea was to get it at the northern extremes of their property and the southern extremes, which are near the railroad tracks in Ione and near Highway 88 and um, 124 as far as the north and south locations at their project entrance on 124 and then again on Brickyard Road near the entrance to the wildflower subdivision. Okay, we have a, another member the public that would like to speak. Oh. Just for the record, just say who you are. A, a couple of things. First of all, the gentleman in the fetching hat, I didn't catch his name, he's soft-spoken. Um, he's absolutely right about the process, and it, the same thing happened to us regarding the jail project. It was pushed and uh, rushed, and uh, a step, the planning step was skipped, and it, the time is short, so that the only thing you're left with is uh, filing a lawsuit within 30 days of of the acceptance of the of, of the approval so the, the and I do notice that all along 
th there is an effort to uh, evade the proper process. Uh, and part of what I was going to talk about later is a, 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 the Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter said that the history of liberty has largely been the history of the observance of procedural safeguards. And you seem to want to ignore that. And you have to keep back coming back to it if the law says and the codes say you're supposed to go through planning and then go to the board, or if you're supposed to take different steps in the courts, then you have to obey that process. Otherwise, you're denying people due process under the law. Um, well, my understanding was, is we are, we are going through due process here. What? We are going through due process here. This is just the, the potential. Well, I mean, but he said, he said it was a matter of process. You're evading. Uh, I know that, that the planning member is here, but um, he, 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 it didn't go th through from what I gathered from what I could hear of what he said. It didn't go through the processes that he supposed it would go through. I mean, isn't that what that's, you said? That's not what I understood, but. Do you want to clarify, Chuck? Or I, I believe that's what he contended. But okay, right. My under, my interpretation of the requirements is that is not applicable here in the decision to to do a test to to do the test. Right. Just for clarification, we're not entitling the project in any way. That's right. Thank the you. We're here is because we had taken primary uh, previous code enforcement action. And it, that we can't ask the planning commission to uh, direct us to allow the test without taking code enforcement action. They have no discretion or authority to do that. That's why it's in front of the board. Thank you. Yeah. It, oh, I'm trying to think. There was something else. That was, uh, it blew it out of my. He blew it out of my head. So uh, it, it's just that it, it seems that the rights of individuals or protesters are overridden in the fact of getting things done in an expedient manner. So I sympathize with him. I've, we're, we're going through it. Oh, the, the real estate agent who spoke. Um, I also am a, an inactive real estate broker. So I sympathize with her. I think the only way to fight this kind of thing where her clients are complaining is to go through the assessor's office and ask for a reduction in the tax in in the tax burden if it's lowering the value of the property and the desirability of a purchase the, the only way anyone's going to understand anything is evidently through the pocketbook so i would suggest you get all the people there who don't want to you know get a petition signed and have all those people come in and say this project is going to lower the value of my property by so much, and you want, in, in the, before, the, before the Assessment Appeals Board, get that reduction. You need to do that like we need to do it, because you're going to have 60 extra prisoners in my backyard. That's certainly going to low, lower the value of my property and that of my neighbors, and we need to get together and get our tax burdens lowered in, because it's really hurting the value and desirability of our properties. Okay. Well, okay. Anybody that, and all the people that would protest the approval of this project can start with the Planning Commission. It hasn't been there yet. This is right. just for a test. Two hours. Well, you know, I think it's... And then they can come to the board if, it, if it's it needs appealed to, to me, the board. Or, okay, all right. So due process is very important to all of us. On the board oh. here. Not to him. Okay, so the pleasure of the board. The, uh, My understanding I again is that we don't need to make any action on this. Staff is asking you to sort of confirm what? that they're allowed to that do this given to, the, okay. the fact that they've um, sent the letter saying you're in violation, you're sort of blessing the, the two hour test. Can we do it by consensus or do we need a motion? Or? I don't think this matters, however the board wants to. If you'd like to bring back the, the details of the test, I think yes. that would 
I think Please. Supervisor Forster would appreciate that as well, being able yeah. to weigh in on that. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, since that's his district, yes. That is his <laughs> district as well. The uh, He has asked me to ask that some sort of a motorcycle expert be uh, available to verify that the, the vehicles being used are are similar to those that would be used otherwise or have been used in the past, as well as to uh, the question whether or not the, the hours that have been used have been operated, in, which I think was from 9 to 3. Uh, would, would it be uh, beneficial to have those hours duplicated as well? We know when the test could be conducted. It's um, set for July 7th right now. Oh, okay, so it is July. All right, so a hot time. July uh, 7th, yeah. 7th it's from probably noon to two. <laughs> Then we're going to need to, yeah, we're going to need to have a special meeting if the board's going to weigh in on those criteria. We won't have another meeting before July 7th. So weigh in on where the location of the monitors? No, no. Oh. Um, if if you wanted to hold it over for Supervisor Forrester, they're going to have to change the date of the test probably. Isn't right. that what you're saying? Uh, is or we have a special is, meeting. Does he want, did he ask you? Because he didn't ask me. He, he would, well, he's asking for those criteria to be included. Uh, so either having the motorcycle expert on site or uh, the hours of operation be the same or the independent noise uh, uh, monitoring be done. So these are, this is all, um, that's why I was thinking it might be good to, to bring it back at a different time. I didn't realize we were under such a time constraint. Okay. What's the pleasure of the, did you want to say something, Jim? Well, yes. Uh, I was asked by a member of the audience uh, if I could clarify um, a term I use, PM10, which stands for particulate matter 10 micrometers. And so that is um, what's considered uh, fine um, particulates that can become airborne. And just to give you context, if you took uh, human hair and did a cross section, that's about 100. And so um, 10, you know, you could get um, so many across the width of a human hair. So these are fairly fine particles. We chose uh, PM10 because the real dangerous particles are PM2.5. Those are much, much smaller than PM10. So we feel like if we're getting a read on the PM10, uh, then we know we're encompassing, you know, all of the, um, the particulates that can be um, dangerous to, to the health and respiratory systems. But what if Thank PM10 you. is too heavy and you're not seeing it, but PM2.5 is light enough to propagate out and... Well, um, the, the PM10, I know, is what was recommended by the consultant and by the um, public health officer. So um, The fact that she was involved reassures yeah. me, actually. Yeah, so that, that was what was, um, and I'm, I'm forgetting if there was a specific. Um, it's less than, less than PM10. Yes, under. So they're measuring for stuff under that. So I think it would catch what Frank is asking about. Well, possibly not. PM10 is probably going to be heavier and may not travel as far. So if you're not seeing it, that doesn't mean the lighter, you know, parts of the distribution. Of but, it's, but, but it says total quality of particulate matter less than. PM10. So it's going to catch 2.5. So, so everything, yeah, I'm sorry. Clarification, thank no. you, Supervisor Onetto. Everything up to PM10. Yes. We'll right. catch 2.5. That's right. right. Okay. The wishes of the board on this issue. No, one, one thing I, I, I will say, um, you know, I, I've heard, a lot, heard a, lot, a lot of people talking about the project. I'm not going to go into yes or no's, but there's a lot of talk out there. But I think how, just doing some measurements wouldn't be a bad thing. I mean, not sitting for or against it, and the project is pretty close to town. But I think some, I think some measuring might put some numbers on that, and you can look at that and uh, there. And I think actually when it gets down to it at some point, it'll be the Planning Commission, possibly Board of Supervisors, um, even be just the measurements it might also be how people feel about it so I, I think having some measurements probably would be helpful um, okay so are, are we 
wanting to do a motion on that or just a consensus? Consensus, like consensus yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think Pat, I'd be happier with regular real life information rather than off a model. So, right. By so consensus, you, I'm fine with that. You're fine with the test. What about you, Frank? Uh, yeah, I'm comfortable. Um, I am I think, too. I think, so. I think from the board, it's July seventh, two thousand eighteen, from twelve p.m. to two p.m. And right. if you're not busy, it probably wouldn't hurt to go down there and drive around and listen. So you have your direction, Chuck? Yeah, Jim. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to item 6G. This is going to be a long one also, right? I'll tell you what, before we get into that, because it's probably going to take a few minutes, um, let's do some other quicker ones like 6H, Veterans and Affordable Housing Bond Act of 2018, Discussion and Possible Action Relative to Adoption of a Resolution in Support of the Subject Act. I think, am I the one that asked for this to be on the agenda? Well, I, I, <laughs> I, think I, I forwarded it to you from <laughs> oh, there you go. Mul Mulford. From there you go, Detroit so it's Village, all yours. Who actually, um, she's, I, I don't, she's not here today, but I did, I did tell her that we were putting it on. She asked that it be put on, um, that, are, that we adopt a resolution in support of it. As you can see, the, the act is, is on the state ballot, and um, it will raise, I think, $4 billion for, you know, for veterans housing. So uh, I don't know if I'd say four billion for veterans housing. There's a there's a there's a billion set aside for veterans housing, and there's three point some billion set aside for all kinds of other stuff. There is a large element, though. For you know, so I looked at this. It, you know, the title says you know veterans housing and in, in afford veterans and affordable housing bond act. It should probably say more like affordable housing bond act uh, with some veteran funding. I mean. But I think there's a, there's a billion for farm, home, and mobile home purchase assistance for veterans. And mortgage assistance. And it's on page 122 of yeah. the um, item 8. You know, looking at this, one, pro one thing I find it really ironic we're trying to um, supposedly provide affordable housing. And I look at some of the stuff in here where, where we're sued under a general plan, which will make housing very unaffordable. I look at government rules and regulations we have put in place that have made housing very unaffordable. I look at all the, the timber, i.e. lumber, that we have let rot in this nation, which makes lumber very a lot more expensive. And I think a, a lot of actions the government has taken has made affordable housing very unaffordable and now we want to charge taxpayers to um, make quotes affordable housing I mean I kind of find it a little bit hard to stomach well then if we have a motion you can vote, vote against it I, w I will say this um, I do support veterans um, I think they've done a lot for our nation um, not against veterans but I don't, I don't kind of I don't like this uh, legislation any public comment? Okay, board. Well, um, I, I don't think any legislation is perfect. Uh, problem that's we're seeing throughout California is uh, housing crunch um, due to occurring in the Silicon Valley is cascading over um, to valley and now up to the foothills and it's very difficult for people basically living on minimum wage or or on the the lower rungs economically to um, find you know any fucking in the apartments um um Are you going to make a motion? I will make a motion that we uh, support the resolution. And I will second that. And under discussion, yes. Um, 
I'd also say it's uh, if you look at California's population growth, um, there's very uh, uh, it's a small amount is coming from uh, native population. I think you're seeing also a lot of effects from um, immigration uh, using up a lot of available housing stock, and so the item of note. Okay, I'm going to call for the question. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And aye. Nay. I four, see just four one zero. One more bond we got to pay for. Okay, let's go to item six G. That was three one and one, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, three. The other four one zero. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, three one and one. And then we will go to item six I. As I will, let's do six G now. The um, Possible action relative to progress being made on the items required by the general plan settlement. There are a number of requirements set forth by this settlement, and this update will demonstrate the planning department's plan and schedule to meet those requirements. This is information only. Thank you again, Chuck Beatty, planning department. Um, in March of this year, you approved the settlement agreement to resolve the litigation related to your adoption of, <clears throat> excuse me, the general plan in 2016. Uh, that agreement requires you to consider several uh, amendments to the county code and adopt uh, a few policies or practices relative to um, our evaluation of new development projects. Those required actions were divided into two cat to add two uh, deadlines. Some of them were due within six months of your approval of the settlement agreement, some within two years. Uh, the, the purpose of having this on the agenda is just to let you know that staff's on schedule to have the six-month items taken care of in-house. Um, the Planning Commission would consider those items on August 14th, and we'll have them to the Board of Supervisors on September 11th. Um, if you know, the, the two-year deadline items, we anticipated that would require some outside consultants' help on those. That's been addressed in our uh, request in, for next year's budget. If for any reason you want to accelerate the two-year items and get them done sooner than two years, that would require additional money in the uh, coming year's budget. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so we have to con basically consider these um, oh, amendments. It um, doesn't necessarily mean that we have to pass them. We have to consider them. And I guess the question I would have on items seven, eight, and nine that are look to be considered by the board at this point at Mar on March 27, 2020, we have to treat those as basically as part of the general plan or for our ordinances until until we've addressed them for our settlement. Is your question? Do we have to? I'd, no, you don't have to. You're asking, do you have to um, consider some version of of those or standards to be in place prior to? No. no. Okay. Thanks. That you wouldn't have anything to consider to be in place. I I didn't know if there's something to look at or okay. But I would hope that we would, um, the board would show the integrity to consider those um, ordinances when we're considering approval of projects. Maybe, you know, I hear what you're saying, Greg, that if they're not in place yet before 2020, then, you know, they don't have to be considered. But, you know, we made this settlement in good faith, and I think that's a that's something that we should at least consider, or you. I guess I won't be here by then, so. If Any other questions? Thank you. All right. You got off easy in that one. Okay, let's go to item six. Public, public comment. Oh, I'm sorry, public comment. I beg your pardon. My bad. <laughs> 
Sorry to be persistently commenting. Um, Catherine Evett for Foothill Conservancy. I appreciate that you put this on the, on the agenda. Um, it's a lot to do in a fairly short amount of time with no activity for the last several months. So I'm glad things are moving with that. Um, I, I was a little concerned to see that the, the zone code, zoning code changes are going to be put in something called design standards or design sections, general plan, when some of them are findings that have nothing to do with design but have to do with biological resources and fire and things like that. So, I mean, our settlement didn't declare how you were going to modify your zoning code, but I just wondered about that. Um, I have some related questions that really aren't about the settlement but are about general plan implementation, and so I don't expect an answer from you, but something to consider. Um, I'm curious whether the county has submitted its general plan annual progress report to the state, and if so, if that's available. Um, I'm curious when the zoning code is going to be updated to be consistent with the general plan. That's usually the first thing that happens in a jurisdiction after general plan out of, uh, general plans are amended. And right now, um, the planning commission and the board is being asked to review and approve, as you did today, general plan changes and zoning code changes when, as far as I know, nobody's ever really tracked to see what needs to happen to the zoning code to make sure that it is legally compliant with the general plan. And there are some inconsistencies, in our opinion. Um, I'm also concerned, we are concerned as an organization, that you might request from your staff a progress report on completing the items in the general plan implementation plan. Several of those are due to be completed within two years of the general plan's adoption, which would be this coming October. As far as I know, there's nothing underway for them. For example, for the town centers, the county in its general plan implementation plan said it would adopt design um, guidelines and form-based codes for the town centers, but the Planning Commission just approved a big project in Pine Grove that's not going to be subject to those because nobody started to approve them yet. And so I, I, I would just request that the board consider asking of staff to lay out the timeline for, for the implementation plan that's part of the general plan to make sure that you're on track, because it appears to me that you may not be. And I was made aware that some of the planning commissioners, until perhaps the publication of the settlement agreement in this board packet, have never been apprised of the content of the settlement agreement. So they don't really even know what the county pledged to do. So I um, don't know if that's true or not, but I did get that from a planning commissioner. So we hope um, that the county will proceed to implement the general plan, proceed to implement the settlement, and um, you know definitely bring your zoning code into compliance with the new general plan so that all your approvals are then legally compliant and consistent with the general plan as well. Thank you. Chuck, can you respond to what our timeline is here for zoning? Well, the, the, the timeline on the implementation of the general plan essentially began upon your um, uh, adoption of the settlement agreement. I mean, it was in litigation from November of 2016 until March. We didn't proceed on uh, on implementation, not knowing which direction that that was going to go. But I understood it. Thank you, Greg, because I so, understood. So it's, it, it's difficult and, I don't know, I would say uh, a little unfair and impractical for uh, uh, a demand that we implement the um, general plan mitigation measures while, while it was being challenged. The county certainly wouldn't want to expend those resources to implement a general plan that could have been set aside if the litigation had gone forward. So we're sort of caught um, behind the curve a little bit, and certainly I think staff wants to uh, move forward with those, and the board, uh, I mean, it, it, it really is a resource allocation question for the board um, the more resources to planning to implement them the, the faster they can all get done um. I would agree it seems to me kind of like the person that threw the rock on the road is complaining that you got a flat tire it, it they should be done and they they're required in the general plan um, but it, 
weren't working on implementing them during a pending right. lawsuit. I understand that. So have you considered when you might work on those? We're, we're working on those now. The first, oh, okay. The, okay. the number one priority was to handle those six month items that came out of the I settlement. understand. Yeah. Very good. But, but and now I, you're I, rolling on to the two year ones. Right. I, I, I think Mr. Thought makes a valid point. I mean, it would be, it, it, it is unfair to, what if the litigation had gone on past the two year mark? Then you could stand, somebody could say, well, you didn't do anything during those two years while it was tied up. That's, that's, that's not a fair approach. <laughs> Catherine Evett again. I'd just like to respond to that, having been called a rock thrower. Um, you know, what I'm talking about now is not implementation of the settlement agreement. It's the basic things you do to implement your general plan. And while it's reasonable to stay those things while the litigation is going on, the litigation did not legally stay your general plan. It went into effect the day you approved it or the day it was certified. And it's you have known and your staff has known since before the end of March that this settlement was going to go through. And as far as I can tell, there's been no action by the staff to bring the zoning code, this is outside of the settlement, to bring the zoning code into conformance with the general plan, which could have begun any time and certainly could have begun since the settlement was signed. So there's been, you know, May... Signed or the end of April, you've had April, May, and June. What's happening is projects are continuing to be processed under your old zoning code. And so um, while I appreciate that Mr. Beatty is working on implementing our general plan, so